you're alive. Yep, yep. live and alive. Okay, members and witnesses, you're very welcome to this meeting of the Education Committee. Um, delighted to have the Education Minister with us this morning. Uh, Clark, are there any apologies for the committee to record? Just uh, William Humphrey. <coughs> okay. Minister and members, can I apologise for the delay to the start of the meeting this morning that was due to uh, quite a significant technical difficulty. Um, we'll proceed um, promptly. Minister, before you, you begin your oral briefing this morning, um, could I ask in these exceptional circumstances that, and due to that delay, that we make a, a slight procedural adjustment and that I ask you to uh, focus your comments on the uh, GRADE Awards 2020 this morning? Um, and that you would give a commitment and agreement to return to the committee early next week to, with regards to the equally urgent matter of school restart in, in more detail. Is that yeah, possible? I mean, yeah, I can do. I suppose in terms yeah. of opening remarks, principally, obviously, as the, I was intending obviously to address both, as opposed this was principally set up on the restart side yeah. of it. Most of the remarks I had and most of the information I had focused was on the restart side yeah. of it. I, from that point of view, I'll be happy to tic-tac uh, with the committee, I don't know whether it necessarily be early next week on it, but uh, well, because obviously diaries will have been will have been put in place in relation to that. But look, I'll okay. see I what we can work. I appreciate that, and if you want to make some key comments with regards to school restart, obviously we'll endeavour to facilitate that as well. But there will be a, num okay. a, a num okay. understandably a number of questions with regards to Great Award 2020 uh, from the members today. Before we all start, can I, I ask our, our our committee and, and our witnesses today to? to bear the well-being of the children and young people across Northern Ireland um, in, in mind and to guide our, our actions um, with them in mind. Um, they've obviously had significant challenges um, throughout COVID-19 and compounded um, in this difficult week as well. But on that note, Minister, I invite you to make um, opening remarks. OK, well, as I said, we'll then deal with I mean, there's extensive remarks on the restart, but I'll leave those for another occasion on that basis. Um, Obviously, yesterday, young people in our schools received their AS and A-level results. So, I want, first of all, I think it's important to put this on record to congratulate all those young people on their achievements. And I think, to some extent, while we focus in on the uh, door, it's coming won't close. Apparently, reach, reach the technical difficulty. Actually, the door won't close as well. Um, so while I think it's important, obviously, that uh, there will be focus in on various issues arising out of it, I think it's important that we do take a little bit of time also to congratulate those young people on their achievements. Uh, and I think that also reflects not simply on them, but also on their parents and teachers for supporting them in what are challenging times. There has been an increase in those achieving grades at A, a star to AC, uh, sorry, to C across all school types which reflects an upward trend and improvement across our education system, uh, quite specifically in terms of um, the A-levels. Uh, we have seen an overall increase of 1.6% in those figures, up to 86.4%. Uh, uh, and at AS level, there uh, has been, sorry, yes, at AS level, there's been a 2.2% uh, increase up to 77.3%. Uh, that is also the case uh, that when you analyse that in terms of specific aspects uh, of those results, it is effective an improvement uh, across each of the, the, the grade sectors, so that there is an improvement in the number of A stars, for example, there is an improvement in the, in the amount of A star to Cs, and a similar pattern can be shown as regards uh, AS levels. <coughs> and perhaps significantly, whenever we are looking at issues around uh, the tale of um, on the issue of attainment, uh, the position in terms of uh, the U grade, um, which uh, which relates to both the A level and the AS level, has seen uh, a significant decrease in both A level and uh, AS level. So those who those entries that have received a U grade this year at A level has gone down to 0.9%. Uh, in practical terms, that's a little bit under 200 papers out of 26,000 uh, have been graded as being a U. Uh, by comparison, last year that was at 1.7 per cent, so we've seen that nearly halve in the space of a year. For AS level, uh, where there is a higher percentage in terms of 
uh, use and always has been, it has gone down from 4.5% to 3.6%. That is also the case that this reflects across all school types. And so, um, for example, on the A level with the A star to C, uh, we have seen a better, um, compared, compared between sectors, a better performance for uh, non-selective schools where the gap was closed by, I think, 1.9% uh, in terms of uh, achievements compared to uh, selective schools. The position is, is more stark within uh, AS level uh, with the improvement for on the A to C for grammar schools being 1.7%. But for non-selective schools, they have seen their, uh, their grades improve by 7.3%. Uh, in that which means that the gap has closed from um, around about uh, was 17 and a half percent to around about 12 uh, percent which is a very significant uh, reduction in the level of of, uh, of gap it's important that all, all this debate and discussion around that that we don't undermine or fail to recognize those who celebrate their achievements there are elements within this story that, that, that need to be told as well so I'm confident the vast majority of our, uh, of our A-level students now have outcomes that will now allow them to progress with their plans for the future. Uh, however, I appreciate that there has been concerns raised with the system that has not worked for everyone, and that there will be some disappointed young people feel that, uh, that we have not achieved the stated aim of ensuring everyone receives uh, fair outcomes that reflect their hard work. Everyone engaged in this process was focused on doing the best for our young people in what are extraordinary terms. This includes taking a long-term view that not only do these grades need to be fair this year, they need to be fair to those who got an outcome last year, and ensure that these qualifications will stand up to scrutiny in future years so that there is no long-term detriment to those young people who get results today. And it is also, we need to bear in mind, particularly from the position of the disruption that has happened with covid of the position particularly for A-level students, for AS-level students, uh, that will be completing their studies in 2021. As far as practical, we wanted to, make to be in a position to demonstrate that a grade A awarded this year without exams is every bit as robust and valid as a grade A awarded last year, and the same grade in different schools was at a consistent standard. That's why I, I decided that, that there needed to be a standardisation process as in some form that happens every single year in terms of examinations. My department and CCA were in regular con uh, contact with their counterparts in England and Wales at GCSEs as A-levels operate in a three-country model, and therefore it was agreed that our young people uh, would be best served if we aligned our processes as far as possible, taking account uh, of policy differences. So it is Perhaps a little bit disappointing that Wales dis uh, departed from this approach to some extent at the last minute and without consultation. As part of our process to develop a solution for Northern Ireland students, representatives of head teachers, uh, teaching unions, students, managing authorities, and the, uh, and the Education and Training Inspectorate were all consulted before we reached the point at which uh, there was final sort of decisions on the various models that were approached. And there's a different uh, process model has been put in place for A-levels, for AS-levels and for GCSEs. Everyone recognised that there was no perfect solution and to that extent the best solution was one that uh, would have been examinations taking place but that was not practical this year. It is arguably therefore there was no best solution. We were looking at what we could create as a least worst solution and no one suggested a different workable process for delivering fair and robust grades in the space or time that was available. CCEA did what was asked of them, and I believe the outcomes overall are valid. I accept that not everybody feels that way, so I want to give assurance that the appeals process will allow schools and young people to explore uh, every avenue that, they, that needs to be explored to understand the outcome that they have been awarded. In particular this year with the appeals process, which has uh, been unique to it, um, <coughs> will be a widening of that appeals process. Normally the appeals process purely deals with process or procedural issues. This will take into account where evidence can be submitted uh, at three schools at school level, at either groups or alternatively for individuals, where, there has, uh, where prior attainment can be used then as evidence 
to suggest uh, that someone should have received a different grade. And where that can be shown within the appeals process, then the appeals process will reflect that and will lead to um, alterations in the uh, A level. From that point of view, I have asked CCA to publish additional information on how the process worked uh, and to include uh, exa exemplar material. So I think it's important that there is, from that point of view, as much information that is given as possible. But I appreciate that the committee will have, a, I'm sure, a wide range of questions, so I'll be happy to respond to those. And I know I think you're having the Chief Executive CCA as well, so there may be some technical issues which, in terms of the level of detail he's able to go into, may be able to do so on a, on a better basis directly than the Department. But we will try and answer questions as best we can, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Minister, can I, I start by asking you if you would wish to apologise to the pupils that have been so distressed by the downgraded results that they received yesterday? Well, from that point of view, I feel very sorry for... I understand the disappointment that people have. It is important, and I think at the heart of this, uh, must be an understanding that no one has been downgraded. There has been a difference between where teachers have assessed what uh, pupils sh uh, they feel should be getting and what the actual results are. That, albeit we're in very unusual circumstances, has been the same for a number of years. Uniquely Northern Ireland, um, for the last number of years, has got teacher assessments of um, at A level, AS level, GCSE, of what they believe from teachers people should be given. I think it the only difference with this year is it is slightly more comprehensive and that normally I think that accounts for the data is about 60%, roughly it's now 100%. So no one from that point of view has been downgraded now. Are there within that clearly individual cases where in terms of the system and the modelling uh, will not have produced the right result? Uh, that is the case and that is why I think we need an open, robust appeal service to be able to take account and to look at those cases on an individual basis rather than try to simply apply a, um, you know, a, a situation. But it's clearly the case that every year there will be uh, expectations for pupils, there will be disappointments for pupils. I can understand that. I think it is more difficult, I can understand certainly, for anybody in that position to take it this year because to some extent where someone simply has the black and white um, result of here is the pure result of an examination rather than here is the result of a system, uh, I think it is a lot easier for people to accept where it's an examination system. And I think that is, that is undoubtedly the case. Okay, I'll move us, I'll move us on. I'm, I'm conscious there will be a number of questions from, from members this morning as well. Um, so, Minister, in terms of Grade Awards 2020, the, the day you announced cancellation of exams on April the 16th, mm -hmm. um, since that day you have received robust questions with regards to the alternative model that you've chosen. Questions in particular relating to the use of rank ordering, use of past school performance. I have minutes from the meeting of the Education Committee uh, on June the 3rd, where the committee noted significant concern in respect of the statistical model used to inform the process of awarding grades, um, than that the model had yet to be fully developed, subject to any testing, that its characteristics and method of application had yet to be explained fully and communicated clearly. The committee also felt that the professional teacher assessment is a reliable basis on which to proceed. Um, since then, um, we've had our results yesterday. I know that members and MLAs have been inundated um, with uh, principals and pupils that have been shocked, confused and distressed by the outcome of that model. Um, I have one example, and I'm sure members have many, but I have one example of a, a subject area in a school that the grades for A star to C at A level this year are 30% reduced on last year from 90% to 60%. Uh, 20 kids of 120, 60 um, have not yet got a university place. Examples of pupils in rank ordering um, at the top of their rank order, receiving um, as many as two grades below that grade, and yet others lower than them in that rank order, still receiving the grade that they were originally rank ordered in. Um, this is a, a serious and significant problem, Minister. Um, I, I put to you that however good intentioned, however much hard work, 
and Endeavour has gone into that particular model that you and SIA have failed to explain in a clear and transparent manner the way in which the model has operated um, and that this model has failed many pupils across Northern Ireland and indeed put university places at risk. The extent of this failure is such that it can't be adequately addressed by an appeals process in, in, the, in the time scale available. Uh, a failure that it seems is likely to be replicated for GCSEs next Thursday and therefore I put to you and I will ask the Education Committee to support this proposal that in these exceptional circumstances, unprecedented circumstances during which pe young people have made unprecedented sacrifice that you act decisively and that you move to ensure pupils are awarded whatever grade is highest of their AS level grade, their teacher assessed grade or their SEA awarded grade and that that same approach is applied to GCSEs for next Thursday. Okay, I mean there's a lot of a lot that's in there so if you'll forgive me I want to deal with each of those points uh, where possible um, so it may take a little bit of time. Uh, you mentioned, for instance, in terms of the past school performance, uh, that is not part of... Uh, look, the one thing I think, sorry, I, to a large extent, I think there is an argument, because it is quite technical, the ability to explain and communicate clearly, albeit that, that I think schools were given information in relation to this, it was sent, sent out. So, But if in a public, public sphere the information is not clear enough and hasn't been clear enough, and in part because of the complexities of that information, then... I accept that, that uh, whatever could be done and what maybe could have been done, maybe we could have done more in terms of explaining. Can I deal with just some of the issues you've raised? Past school performance plays no part whatsoever in the A-level modelling. There is not a single percentage point that relates to that. And that is because there is other elements of reliable data that could be put in place. And that's, that's well established. It will apply to GCSE, so I don't think you need to labour that particular point, Minister. No, but it's, you've, you've made reference in terms of concerns okay. there. So I just, I just want to put that on the record to make okay. that clear. You say that professional teacher judgment um, is sound and accurate in terms of, in terms of that. Uh, look, there is no doubt that where we were at, uh, first of all in terms of statistics, around about... 57.6%, I think it is, of the teacher grades that were suggested by teachers have then been ac have accurately reflected what the final position was. Around about 96, 97% of overall teacher bits were either that or one grade of, of difference. There would be around about 3% that may be described as a certain level of outliers where there's two or more. That, however, does suggest that there's a considerable gap between uh, what teachers predicted and what uh, pupils received. But that, in many ways, is not unexpected. Teachers will have, and I think for very valid reasons, will tend to look more optimistically in terms of the grade results than what actually happens in practice. How do we know this? Because for the last number of years, uh, SIA within Northern Ireland have been getting, prior to results being issued, teacher predictions on what on what their uh, on what their, their their students should be receiving, and in previous years, while there's maybe been levels of additional extra care that has been taken this year, the level of accuracy figure last year was 46 percent, the year before was 44 percent, and on each of those occasions, teachers overestimating from a, from a pure it is a factual point of view from a factual point of view. Teachers overestimating what they believe their students should get compared to the actual exam result. In each case, it was more than 40% of grades had them at least one, part, one mark, uh, one grade over. Previously, I think, in terms of that last year, that constituted in 10% of cases, teachers estimating grades would be at least two grades higher than what the, uh, than what the, uh, the student received. This is not just a Northern Ireland phenomenon, but has happened in pretty much every jurisdiction where this has taken place. And so whereas I think the, the indications, the gap between what teachers predicted and what they got was about 38% optimistic in Northern Ireland, I think it was somewhere between 36 to 38% in England. Uh, there was probably similar figures, probably maybe probably higher, similar. probably similar in Scotland. And even in terms of things uh, such as the baccalaureate in, in France, there's been a fairly significant um, indication. Now, we do need 
So therefore, it is clear that the professional teacher assessment is something which statistically, which in practice, in different sets of circumstances, has been shown to be quite different from actual results. And there's Mr. got to be- I, I don't want to intervene too much, you forgive me for doing so on this occasion, and I'm keen to bring other members in as well, but um, how, how can the, um, the endeavor and contribution of uh, teachers to predict uh, and assess um, achievements on this occasion be compared generally with every other type of prediction to which you refer, given the exceptional circumstances that are at play in this year? No, you're, you're comparing as much as possible like with like. What we're actually saying is the teacher predictions this year have been quite different from what the actual results are. The gap actually has, has closed a bit on the basis of they have been seen to be more accurate. And the point is, I think, if you are testing out, uh, and we use the A-level examples, there can be AS levels or others as well, very similar picture, that consistently, year on year, what teachers predict for their pupils will have a large difference between what they are predicting and what the final result is. Uh, you know, there's no doubt in relation to it, and that has happened not just here, but elsewhere. So that, that I think, is the particular relevance in relation to it. You say in relation to testing, yes, there was a, a limited amount of time, but for example, in terms of testing them all, not only I think that CCEA, and, and Justin could probably go into this in more detail, uh, worked with statisticians, worked with, um, you know, worked with all those who were experts in the field. But if you take, for instance, the AS level results, where there was a particular model that was put in place, effectively a dry run was done a, uh, on what happened in 2019, where the modelling which involved levels of um, a mixture of past performance by the school and mean test, GCSE test results. So effectively, if we had abandoned exams in 2019 and applied all the data that was there in 2019 on this methodology, and it produced something that was, I think, very much uh, of, the, of exactly the same nature as the actual results in 2019. So it's, it's not from that point of view um, on test. If you get me, obviously, I know that there's quite a few things you'd said. Okay. Well, there, look, may, there, I, may, there may be a few, a few the other key, things. The key and, point for me, Minister, is, and you use the phrase yourself in your opening remarks, incorrect results. You know, do you recognise the scale of incorrect results that have been awarded as such that it can't be dealt with via an appeals process adequately? No, I... And that you need to intervene to allow pupils to receive a grade based on their individual ability and the highest of their AS level grade, teacher assessed grade or CA awarded grade? But here's the point that regard, Chair. No, I don't... Look, I, I would say that in terms of the level of incorrect grades, if we put it that way, are probably less. You put this. it that way. What's oh, right? You put it that way. You well, okay. It, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, look. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe then you <coughs> put it that in relation to that. The, the point is that that in terms of the level of differences, particularly between teacher performance and the the final grade, was less this year than it was in previous years. There will always be some grades that are incorrect on that basis. And you say about the need for individuals to be looked at. That is why actually a robust appeal system which allows individuals and individual um, uh, prior attainment to be taken into account is actually the correct way of doing it because it actually tailors it to the individual. Now, by contrast, if we took, for instance, let, let me make two issues in relation to what you've said on the issue of, shall we say, the, the, the call it um, that they would be guaranteed effectively the lowest out of three particular aspects, the AS level, the teacher assessment, and their actual grade. Uh, that would actually put us in a position where we are actually putting in each of the elements out of, out of Wales and Scotland and combining them. Within Northern Ireland, um, if we used, for instance, the teacher assessment side of things, we would move up in a situation on the A levels where the level of change of pass rate if we count the, or from the A star to C, we move up from 84.8% to 95.1%. That's even without taking into account the issue that there will be some beyond that who will then be brought up by AS levels. We would not have any level of credibility. You would have a situation where for AS levels, it would be brought up from about 75% to around about 91, 92% on that basis. A leap of that statistical bit would mean there would be no credibility whatsoever for people receiving those grades. And that will count against people in the long run when it comes to employment, when it comes to 
places in, in, in terms of things. But also, not only is it not fair between pupils between years, but within years. Because you will get some, some teachers who will be quite tough in their assessment, others who will be very, very generous. So there will be no equality whatsoever. Uh, it will depend from teacher to teacher, from centre to centre, what attitude they took, what approach they took, which will mean that for some pupils they will get uh, a large boost beyond uh, where they've got it at present. Maybe that, sometimes that will be fair, sometimes that will be unfair. For others they will be held back and not actually made a change. It will not create any level of level playing field between, between students. You've got to have something which then, could, yes, can take the individual bits, but if you simply apply that blanket approach across that, you will lack any credibility of, of examination qualifications. <coughs> you take us, for example, out of sync with England, which is around about 85% of the, the UK market. And the one thing is a very small section of a small region, if more so than anywhere else, if we damage our credibility, if it is felt that Northern Ireland examinations in terms of the grades are not really worth the paper they're, they're written on, that will be of massive detriment. Oh, that grade from Northern Ireland, that's not as good as a grade from um, somewhere else. It will also create a level of inequality for the number of students uh, that, for instance, will take examination series from uh, examination boards outside of Northern Ireland in terms of the, the impact, so we wouldn't have even okay. equality within Northern Ireland. Okay. I, I think you're increasingly isolated um, in that particular view. Mm -hmm. um, these are unprecedented times. Mm -hmm. We've asked unprecedented sacrifice of this cohort of pupils. Um, but we've, but, we have, sorry, let me finish. Yeah. We, we have um, significantly changed our approach to many other aspects of life, um, and I think for this particular exceptional circumstances, I think it, you are increasingly I isolated, dismissing um, support for um, reliance on an extremely robust teacher uh, assessed but approach the, but the to, evidence, to the awarding evidence, grades yeah. for these pupils based sure, on individual sure, abilities. I really want to bring other members in, it Minister. It is clear, Chair, that, that it is not any objective analysis of what has happened this year, last year, other jurisdictions, which suggest that it is, it, there is not, it is clearly not objectively robust because there is very large wide, wide divergence. You rightly indicate that there's unprecedented, but, but we also need to look then at what happens in 2021, where pupils will be doing examinations. The cohort, for instance, that is leaving in A-levels in 2021 will clearly arguably have been more uh, impacted by COVID than those leaving in 2020. Because those leaving in 2020, in terms of their academic teaching, may have missed a few weeks at the very, very end of, of term, because most of them would have, would have gone either at Easter or shortly after. Those who, are, who are, those who are missing, who are going to do exams in 2021, will have missed effectively a full term. They will have missed, they will have levels of disruption. But then to throw those people back without the same level of safeguards to a situation in which there is a different approach in 2021, which relies purely on examination, examination marks would go down uh, from the 2020 figures for a group which is much more impacted and a group which will actually face a more detrimental situation generally, particularly as regards university places. Because with the number of, of students for very valid reasons wanting to um, defer this year, there will be a large cohort that will be entering university in 2021 who are effectively this year's pupils. That means that the number of yes. places for universities in 2021 uh, for the 2021 group will be reduced in relation to that. So we, we create a yeah. double level of unfairness for those in, in 2021. Uh, and, so we've actually got to think ahead, not simply of the decisions yeah, that, uh, that, we make, that we make to, to reach a particular, to deal yeah. with very understandable disappointment that is there this year. We've actually got to look at what the long-term position is and I, actually I, safeguard I, the fairness yeah. for everyone. Yes, I, I agree. And indeed, this committee has consistently raised the need for uh, uh, an innovative solution response to what the curriculum looks like in this coming year and what examinations look like in this coming year. That is a solution that also needs to be found. It should in no way prejudice the solution that you find but for if, pupils if, on this occasion. But it, it is, it in is response fair, to it what is you fair, yourself have chair, referred to it is, as it is. incorrect results. Yep. I need to move on. Um, Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen, MLA. Take a look different with Karen. Okay. okay. Um, have we? Is Robin with us, Peter? No. He's not so okay. Um, we'll move to Daniel McCross, an MLA, then, and I'll come back to Karen as soon as we have her back.
Thanks. Thank you, Minister. Thank, thank you, Chair and Minister. Thank you for being here today. This is a very important uh, discussion that we're having. Uh, and whilst we're talking about models and statistics and anomalies as a result of what has taken place this week, we have to be mindful at all times that we're talking about children and young people, Absolutely. the children and young people of Northern Ireland, the children and young people who, for the last day, I have seen in tears, whose dreams have been shattered, their confidence battered, their families very worried and concerned about their well-being and their health, their mental health. I've seen teachers in tears and shock. They're numb, they're angry, frustrated and feel patronised. I have seen principals very stressed trying to explain the situation to parents and pupils and to the public. And I have also heard Justin Edwards continually over the course of the last day spit out the same regurgitated excuses that have been used throughout the last number of months when this committee, when I, as the SDLP member of this committee, in the Assembly, flagged these issues with you, Minister, directly, have raised these concerns with Justin Edwards continually and have also spoken about them in this committee. Others have done the same. There is leading academics that have also raised very serious and detailed concerns that were ignored, concerns that, Minister, if you have seen them, I would be even more concerned about the situation we are in today. Children have been failed by this system. They have been failed by the Department of Education. They have been failed by the processes of SIA. And we need to be very clear, Minister, because I do not think that you or Justin Edwards of SIA seem to get this. There is a significant level of frustration and anger in the public in relation to how this entire process has been handled. It has not been explained. Even in all of the questions that I have asked from the earliest stages, we were told we are still working on it. We are still working on it. Even on Nolan this week, Justin Edwards could not answer some of the questions that were being put to him in relation to how these grades were determined. Because the reality is, Minister, and the spotlight is very firmly on SIA today and will be after today and on the Department as to how this is handled. There is no clear transparency whatsoever. In fact, there is a veil of secrecy around the SIA processes and how these grades have been determined and indeed processes over previous years. And this entire debacle, yes, we're in a pandemic. Yes, it's, a very it's an unprecedented time and things are very serious. But, Minister, the situation that this has, this has inflicted on the young people of Northern Ireland is even more serious, grave even, because I have seen the tears of the Children's Commissioner. I've heard her on radio. I have heard, as I said, teachers crying. I have heard parents crying. I have also Minister, spoken with the GP last night, who rang me three times yesterday, very stressed to get a hold of me, who said that she has a deep concern for the well-being of young people after three young students who were refused university places, did not get the grades they needed, have presented with suicidal thoughts. Minister, this is a very grave situation because whilst we talk today about statistics and anomalies and mistakes, tomorrow we will talk about the futures of these young people who will be left behind and have missed very important opportunities because of a system that has not been transparent and still has not presented at all the algorithm that has overridden teachers' judgment. We have heard for the last few days teachers criticised teachers' judgment pulled into question. What does that do for the morale of our teaching workforce, who have supported our young people, Minister, throughout the course of the last few months, who have supported our young people, who have worked in very stressful situations to ensure that people are educated? And, Minister, for Justin Edwards to sit on a radio and say that teacher judgment is not acceptable because it's inflated without any basis of evidence whatsoever put into the public domain or any evidence whatsoever that suggests that SIA or the Department of Education had this information for quite a, a while. To reveal that days before this, when I would argue, Minister, that there has been a revelation or you have realised within the Department and within SIA that this formula could not work. It was not going to work. It could not reach whatever predictions you were hoping to attain in terms of the grades. And I think that the situation we are in today, Minister, presents huge questions as to what we do. We can get our heels dug in and we can say we are not moving on this uh, and we can say that you are not going to take into consideration rethinking this model. This model failed. It failed our children and it failed our young people. And Minister, just to point out, SIA 
sending out grades to schools the day prior to our children receiving them and knowing those grades were wrong, awarding U's where they should have been C's, awarding B's where they are, were clearly A's. Teachers are absolutely infuriated and we're told then it was an anomaly. An anomaly. We are talking about children's futures. We're talking about people who've missed out on university places and you're telling us it's an anomaly. It's not acceptable and what infuriates me, Minister, more so than all of this is that this committee, the chair of this committee and members of this committee warned you and warned other uh, people in CA, including Justin Edwards, that this, exactly what we're experiencing today, would become the reality that we've faced. And I wish, Minister, that in any of the contributions that you, your department or CA met would take into consideration that we are talking about young people. And whilst, yes, you're concerned that grades might be inflated, without any evidence, might I add, that we have seen at all that suggests such at all, the option that's on the table today, the reality, is much worse. It is much worse because it has downgraded. It has downgraded results in schools right across Northern Ireland, including Holy Cross and my own town of Straban, whose grades were reduced by 45%. Daniel, I'm keen to give members. Minister, I just ask. Um, no, no, I'll be, very, I'll be very brief. Daniel, keen to give members leeway today, but do indeed come to come to your questions as well. All right, thank you, Minister. In terms of the formula, yes. Can you explain to this committee? Can you outline to this committee what the formula looks like? Can you produce it to this committee? Can you show us the algorithm that outweighed the judgment of teachers? And can you, Minister, could you produce your homework to be marked? Because the reality is, we're hearing all these statistics from SIA and from the department, and they're not being checked by others. Because I can tell you, the report that I have in front of me today is absolutely damning. And it warned, Minister, it warned Justin Edwards, and it warned you, if you've seen it. I hope you have. Because Justin Edwards has replied to some of the questions and didn't reply to the report. If that's the case, Minister, what we're facing today was told to you. And let me tell you this, Minister, in very blunt terms. Try, try to bring the close. Our young people will not, forgive, to you. will not forgive you, will not forgive SIA, and will not forgive this system if we do not act and stand up and show some leadership and correct the wrongs that have happened to these people. As a result of the pandemic, they should not pay the price. Can you explain, Minister, the formula? Can you okay. also, Minister, very bluntly, in the final question, Chair, is it possible that you, Minister, will support an independent academic review of the processes rolled out by SIA because after what we've learned this week, there is major and serious questions about the veil of secrecy that surrounds the processes, Minister, and also the lack of regulation of this body. Minister, thank you. Okay, I'll try and deal with, uh, I suppose there was a mixture of questions and comments in relation to that. Look, in terms of the position of children for individual children, yes, this has been incredibly stressful. It has been very disappointing for some individual children, as actually happens also in other years as well. In terms of the position of children, there are more children today who have got a top grade. There are more children who have got an A, a star to C grade than were there last year or the year before, and that's at A level, at AS level as well. But you're right in terms of saying that behind the statistics are individuals. That is why, rather than trying to simply throw in some formula which raises for many, doesn't leave others touched and produces no level of merit for that, the way to deal with this is ensuring that where there can be prior attainment shown, that that will be used as evidence that can be used in a successful appeal. Now, you rightly raise the issue of university places uh, the appeals process will be completed in time, particularly for the A-level students, in time for um, uh, the university decisions ultimately to be taken. UCAS have already said that any final award of places will await uh, that. It was, there is a, they have postponed that to the 7th of uh, September, which is well within the time frame of that. And in terms of any consideration of appeals, there will be a particular emphasis on ensuring those that are related the universities will be tackled first, so that from that point of view, everyone who appeals, who is in any way related to a university place, uh, that that change can be made for them, if it's, if it's merited, can be made well before the, uh, 
the closing point at which university places are, are put in put Minister, in place. are some university places not under 24 hour, 48 hour pressure to receive grades, mm -hmm. such, no, uh, such you, as no, Oxbridge, you for cast, example? You cast, you cast have declared that in terms of this, that the appeals process, that, that effectively everything in terms of opportunities will be held until the 7th of September. That is something across the board and particularly uh, relates to, uh, I think, both Queen's and the EU have signed yeah. up to it. I don't know if it's it's an important that. aspect of this, yes, isn't it? Yeah. 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 That's, that's my understanding. And certainly even this morning, there was someone from University of Ulster on the radio saying precisely that, that um, while they're working towards the 7th of September date, they can still actually take students in right up until the beginning of October. Which obviously, actually a, a I range of universities. Of. That, there's obviously a range of universities yes. that students will have applied to, though. So there would need to be assurances and across what, the board if that was. Uh, well, it's, it's a UCAS, it's right. a UCAS okay. assurance. It, it should be across the board. Okay. What we're also seeing this year in terms of universities, there will clearly be pressures on individual courses. Okay. But the concern across <laughs> universities is that they will not have enough pupils to, okay. or students to actually fill their, their places. Yeah, Minister Daniel asked you in particular with regards to the algorithm. Yeah, that has, well, okay, let, has let me explain. To incorrect results. Okay, we, we, we can get you the sort of any of the paperwork side of it, but let me explain, I suppose, briefly in terms of the A level and AS level how things uh, worked. On the A level, the results were a combination of the AS uh, level um, results within a school in terms of that, uh, which count as they count normally for 40% of the overall total. Then what was applied, there's an adjustment made where uh, there is resets have been put in because traditionally, and that will be factored in, in each individual subject, that where resets occur, uh, there will be a variation between subject matters as to what the, the general uplift will be, and that is then applied into those figures then as well. We then apply a formula which is called the Z scores. The Z scores are effectively for a student what their what, what components of the course they have missed by way of uh, uh, of the examination. So the norm with with the Z scores, Z scores. This is used every year, uh, and normally, where to give you an example, it would probably be in a more limited uh, amount. But the Z scores would, for example, Daniel, if you were a, an A level student and suddenly you end up in hospital and missed particular exams, that effectively calculates based upon the. Uh, the data that is there at AS level, what you would have got in those individual uh, courses. Because the other thing as well is, one particular exam is not uniformly as hard or easy as, as another bit. That then gave for each, um, each school a, and for each subject a, a statistical data um, sort of breakdown of the number of uh, at A level, A stars, A's, B's, etc. Same with uh, uh, there will also be a statistical data produced uh, for that bit. What then happened was, and in some cases, the, the ranked order list, there would maybe be question marks asked over the way it was uh, put together, and there was maybe some concerns. But the position particularly of SIA was whatever information was supplied in terms of the ranked order list was, no, it was not altered at all, that that was regarded as being sacrosanct from the school. So if you then had a situation where, for the sake of argument, in a subject in which there were a hundred pupils, they were ranked uh, in that particular subject matter, one to a hundred, and if the result then of that, that model, which doesn't take into account any form of, of previous uh, result, uh, and then in that subject matter, they, that produced then an overall position where, safe for the sake of argument, there were 10 A stars, there were 10 A's, whatever, that was then worked down. So uh, irrespective of the individual uh, wherever they would appear in that ranking list was what they got then whenever that was that was applied but in minister the, there's substantial literature academic literature that confirms the teachers simply cannot predict rank orders and grades with any degree of accuracy whatsoever and can you minister identify a single peer-reviewed study confirming that they can can you but you've because just this undermines Daniel, 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 minister just, 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 just intervene briefly so just, I, th I think that for accuracy i i think the the continuation of that is in the absence of yeah. uh forecasted papers okay yeah, so yeah, just, so, just, just so, to add so that point yeah, because so i realize what we're saying, i realize what we're where you're is, about to take this minister and yeah. that is not going to be the view of this committee i do not so, want you to misrepresent the view of no, daniel, so daniel or of this daniel committee. has just said there's no there's no peer review which has given indications that teacher assessment or indeed rank order can be used for accuracy of result, yet it would no, appear quite... I, I don't, want to, quite, on, I don't quite, want to speak on behalf of Daniel, but I think Daniel would probably add to that, that the actual um, study suggests that there is a need for 
um, papers that are going to be set to be included yeah. in that prediction. However, and what I said at the start as well, Minister, was I gave you an example in terms of this rank order, which does seem to be particularly problematic. Yep. I have I have been advised that a teacher had a, a ranked order for the B grade, where they ranked a pupil second in that B grade, and that pupil received a D grade. Yep. A pupil who was ranked 21st in that B grade received a B grade. How does that algorithm CGU. lead to that okay. result? Sorry, so the, somebody who was higher got a, a, a worse mm. result? Exactly. exactly. Well, look, clearly, and I don't know whether, from where the teacher put that, whether that then ended up being the centre assessment grade, yeah. which uh, you know, there could be some level of alteration. But if there has been, for example, in terms of some communication of data that has been put into place, that that has then been in some way different. You know, I can't obviously comment on an individual case. Okay, but that, that, that's, that's, that that's would give you, surely give you significant concern. Yes, uh, well, in relation to this view, model, and that is that is why on any individual case, and indeed it can also look. There is the option in terms of from appeals, of both individual cases, but also if there is also coming from the school, if they take a view that a batch of results in relation to a subject matter that there has been some mistake made in relation to that, they can also challenge the batch of results as well. So okay. if you had, I, I really need, if, to, if it, if it I need is, to move if it us on, Minister. worked out in geography okay. in a particular school okay. or whatever. Can I, can I bring in well, uh, our well. Deputy Chairperson, Karen Mullen, MLA? Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Karen. I uh, have an internet issue seen this morning. Um, I, I did cut out and miss a bit, so I'm, I'm going to try not to come on what anybody else came in on. Uh, thank you, Minister, for coming this morning. Firstly, I want to also congratulate and commend our young people and students um, uh, for all the hard work and all the effort that they have done over this period. It's been very difficult for everyone. Like the Chair um, and others have said, this is not like any other year, uh, Minister, and you cannot, cannot ignore the reality of that. Um, so the usual model of standardisation should not have should not have been applied, and there is particular issues coming out of that, um, uh, as as evident over the last twenty four hours. Minister, just you know, there's been many debates and discussion about this over and uh, the last uh, twenty four hours, and I just want to ask you today: Do you trust our teachers and their professional judgment? Look, it's not a question of trusting uh, professionals. I teachers do an outstanding job in relation to it. The issue as regards teacher assessment, and this is the case whether it's in Northern Ireland, whether it's in England, Scotland, Wales, uh, and other jurisdictions as well, is that whenever teacher assessments have been done, uh, both in terms of 2019, in terms of 2020, in terms of 2018, there has been a wide divergence between what has actually what they have produced as a teacher assessment and what has been the actual results of um, of the uh, of the examinations so what i'm saying is as a methodology it is clear that that as a methodology is one that does not produce uh, an accurate result but also doesn't produce a fairness a fair result because you are dependent therefore upon and particularly without any level of standardization you are entirely dependent upon how a teacher views it and a difference between teachers. One teacher will be, will be harder than another, one will be easier than another. Now, if a, if a student is then entirely dependent upon what their teacher produces as a result of that, that will mean some pupils will be very advantaged, some will be disadvantaged. And in addition to the issue that we want to ensure that 2020 is treated on a fair and equitable basis with 2019, and also, as, as indicated, I, I, it's about possibly you were out of, the, um, out of screen at, at that particular stage, also with cohorts in 2021 and beyond, it is also the case that if it is reliance purely on teacher professional judgment, we are not treating li people like for like in terms of the current system, in terms of current students. And that would be deeply unfair as well. Minister, I contacted all the post primary schools here yesterday in my city, selective and non selective. Um, every principal um, across each of those schools, the word that they were using to myself was that it was a shambles. They're very angry and frustrated. 
I don't, they don't know of any other profession um, and where their, their judgment would be uh, disregarded in this manner. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they put a lot of time and work and they have the, the evidence there to stand over the grading. So the question they were putting to me was, why do it? What was the point when it wasn't uh, rectified, well, no, accepted, but the, they should have just ranked the grade um, if that's the way it was going to go. So I'm going to give you an example of a school here in, in, in the city, high performing school for many, many years and the record stands and shows it. They get 80% plus A star to C in their students in A level and yesterday it was down to under 60%. Um, so yeah, I did not contact them um, beforehand to say that this was an anomaly. Uh, they don't understand how that can happen. And um, in actual fact, in one of the subjects uh, for the last two years, they have received a 100% A star to C grade. This year, that has dropped to 40%. And as outlined by all our members there, that all of those young people that they had graded as a C were downgraded to a U. Now, that is actually, I suppose, the worst kiss in the schools, all the schools that I contacted, but every school had a story, um, a similar story, had quite a number of students. So I know we, you had given an answer there and put around the statistical model and how the grades can go down, but there is far too many cases for this to be left. The individual um, uh, appeals, I know you've said you will widen out uh, the appeals and you talked there about a batch of appeals, being, a batch of results being able to appeal. Schools didn't know that yesterday. When I was speaking to principals and I asked them, they all contact SIA and asked them to review the school as a batch. Um, because they were under so much pressure yesterday, as we know, the guidance went out yesterday morning. Um, uh, how, in, in particular, that school, they were able, how they were going to sit, get through all these appeals, worried about what's coming down the line next week in, less, in relation to the GCSE, receiving new guidance, having to update their plans um, for schools starting back in less, children starting back in less than a week. So, you know, at this stage, Minister, and I know the Chair has asked, we really do need you to step in, intervene and look at it. This is not any other year. We are dealing with getting children back to school after being off for a long, long time. With still the pandemic out there and the virus, we need to do that safely, confidently. Um, we need to reduce anxiety and this is, situation isn't helping. What we have said in terms of batches that we'll be looking at a school, for instance, can say we are unhappy with the way our cohort was dealt with in a particular subject or whatever, and that would be from a systems point of view to see whether there was a mistake there. But there's also then the opportunity for individuals to commit. Now, if you're saying if there is, for instance, call it an outlier result where there's been a large drop uh, or gap between assessment and there is clear, for instance, evidence of prior attainment of that people, then their, their grade will be upgraded um, at appeal. There's no doubt in, in relation to that. What I indicated in terms of the, um, the position between teacher performance assessment um, and the end result was in 96, 97% of cases, it was either what the teacher gave or it was one grade difference. There's about 3% where there's a, a, a gap of more than two grades. Last year, the comparative figures was there was a 10% gap between what teachers predicted and what uh, what people got in terms of two grades or, or more. So there has been that level of, Min of reduction. Minister, is the manner in which the grades were predicted this year the same as the manner in which they were predicted previously well, to which you're making Pretty much comparison? so, because the prediction, the prediction is on the basis of teacher assessment of what, would, what if you like, uh, you know, Chris Little A level student would have got in his history or whatever it was. It, it is, and the, the methodology in terms of that was it was left open to schools that they can draw on whatever evidence uh, that, that they felt there was a, you know, there wasn't a, a phone. I don't know if I yeah, want to. No, I mean, I'll, I'll explain in the sense that I think it was, there was guidance provided by SIA about the type of evidence that could be used, and you are mm -hmm. quite right. It was a more robust process this year. It was a more robust be, process this year, year than last more year. robust okay. process than last year. Okay. That, is, that is absolutely true, okay. and I've spoken to principals. They have explained their process to me so that I know it was more robust. But ultimately, no matter what happens from school to school and across schools, 
you cannot stand over that what happens in one school is the same as what happens in another school. And I think any teacher or any principal will accept that that is the case. In that particular situation, in an ideal world, probably we would have looked at external moderation of the grades, but that was impossible given our situation and the circumstances we find ourselves in. But a standardisation process is exactly the same thing. And what that standardisation process is designed to do is to ensure that young people actually do get a fair outcome. <clears throat> Now, that does not take away from everything that has happened to the young people that we're hearing about today in any shape or form, but I do think we have to be careful about all the young people who did actually get the grade that their teacher said they would get, which was 60% at least of those young people. And I think what we're trying to do at the moment is tr trying to find a way that is fair. No young person and no teacher wants a child to have a grade that they shouldn't have got or something that two years down the line somebody's going to say, oh yeah, well you got that because of the circumstances rather than because of the hard work you okay. put in. And I think the appeals process that has been put in place, and just to assure you, Karen, I mean that idea of a school where there is a significant drop, absolutely, I take that very seriously, and I think that is something that CAG need to look at alongside the school. But I have spoken to principals yesterday also who said that when they approached SIA, that SIA were very willing to listen to their concerns. And I think certainly from the department's perspective and the minister's perspective, it is very much that the appeals process will be exhausted to whatever degree it needs to be in order to ensure that those young people get the results that they deserve. So but I think, yeah, I, any I teacher, I think any teacher understands that you have to have moderation because we will always have schools who will say, our school did this precisely right, that school didn't. Even when people would have been carrying out those robust processes, they probably would have been thinking about another school or another department who they thought were probably marking or assessing more generously than they were. I the standardisation... I think, yeah, I, I think under normal circumstances, yes, I'm hearing from teachers who would prefer that in, in the context we find ourselves, that we, we revert to teacher prediction mm -hmm. rather than the moderation, the like of which has happened. Very briefly, Minister has referenced incorrect results. You've referenced grades that uh, pupils receiving grades that they should not have got, but you still think that the appeals process is adequate to address both Yes. Circumstances. Yes, sure, because, okay. because okay. on that basis, well, that, 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 that's, that, 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 that's, what, that's, what, that's in that sense what will happen every single year. Okay. There will this be, is not in every, every single year, year there will be let some people bring Karen, will let, me bring, let me bring Karen back, back in very briefly, Karen, and I need to move on to other members. Thank you. Yes, Chair, Chair just to finish off, I disagree. The, the, the appeals process isn't going to cut it. We need that yourself, Minister, that you recognise that there is an issue, there has been failings here. Um, just as that example I give you of that school for many, many years, who has that long track record, and that has happened. So there is failings here. We need you to intervene. Um, we're coming, as I explained, all the restart and GCSEs next, next week. We, we really need you to, to step in and, and address this. Thanks, Karen. Um, can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA? Uh, thank you, Chair. And, uh, can I apologise? I was at a school's transfer um, for the second time in the one transfer this, this week. So I apologise, uh, Chair, for that. But my questions, I think, are, are fairly specific, if, if I can, can address them to you. You'd indicated that, uh, indeed, there are uh, teachers in taking a common approach to assessment, and indeed that some teachers uh, may have been may have been perhaps more generous and some more severe in their marking. Um, in those differences, uh, can can that be quantified? Where the uh, assessment then showed that there were pupils who were perhaps judged by the school uh, more severely, actually got increases in in, in, in their marks. Can I ask well, that one? I think it, I mean, it's a bit difficult to particularly quantify as such, but what you will get, and that's where I think if, there, if we're talking about, for, for instance, an individual student, um, that, um, that you know, if they are showing evidence, and it may be that, that for example, in terms of the ranked list, uh, that you know, a student, um, I think somebody else looking at that would say like, that shouldn't have been higher up the list or lower down the list. It was not CA's job to interfere on the, the list. I suppose the point I'm making in terms of the, the generosity and, and severity will be, um, and it's the same every year in relation to that, 
either at individual teacher level or at schools level, some would treat things more generously or more severely than others. <coughs> that doesn't necessarily mean that they're coming at it from a, a very different position. And however much guidance is given, maybe give some level of, of analogy in a different in a different sphere. And I'm sure all of us have gone through training whenever we're doing appointments, for instance, on a panel. You will sit, you will hear a candidate, you will interview them, you will score them. It may well be that there is a common acceptance amongst um, the panel doing an appointment of who the best candidate is. It may be that everybody on that panel will have scored that person, uh, will, you know, will have given them the, the highest marks out of anybody. But it may be that person A gives them 75% in terms of the way that they would see scoring. The next person might give them 65%. But in terms of, because one is more generous across the board, one is more um, severe across the board. I, I, and so therefore, the problem is that without any level of moderation, you're not comparing like with like. And that's why if, if there's an attempt to simply put a blanket solution, which simply says, we go with the judgments of all the individual teachers, all the individual centers, you know, there will be some, there will be some students who will be treated over generously. There's others who will be disadvantaged and discriminated against in, in relation to that. And that's within sectors, within schools, between schools, etc. Chair, sure, thank you. Um, every year uh, in the results period, we hear about the um, differences between uh, uh, boys and girls. Um, can I ask you, that it hasn't been a factor that has come out this year in terms of that discussion. Uh, how have girls and boys performed against uh, each other right. in the assessment process? Right. Um, trying to look here, I think we have some noted figures here somewhere in terms of the um, Maybe theme. something CA can help us with as well, Minister. Yeah, we do. We do have. We do have figures in, in relation yeah, to that. Certainly send it to I think. I think again, Aaron, what we. Aaron, I'll sort of get, yeah, I can enter. Uh, what the we. Patterns are the same as usual. The same know, patterns. The yeah, I mean, I think the patterns are very similar. So girls, as they they tend to do in examinations this level, will, will tend to outperform boys. I think that broadly speaking, that was the same position on it. There was no, I think, particularly radical adjustment or change between, if you like, the level of gap that was there in 2019 to the position in 2020, uh, the same patterns, I suppose, largely, largely emerged. 84.1 okay. for the boys at a start to say, and 89 for girls. So, so about about a, the same type of difference that there usually is. About a 5% gap between the two, which is, tends to be what, what is quite often the case. And that 5% that is a historical, that's... Yes. Well, look, I'm sure we can get you comparative we'll figures from, you. From, from other years, but what, what I'm saying, certainly in terms of the gender side of it, it, it suggests that the, the normal position, the normal gaps, the normal trends were there this year as compared to previous years. And there, there was a wider discussion about um, gender as it comes to uh, education and uh, how particularly there's help can be given in terms of underachievement on, on boys. I know that's a, quite a specific topic on it. Uh, but I think in terms of the reflection of this year's results, it tended to reflect what, largely speaking, has been there before in terms of the gender, gender gap. Okay. okay. Uh, and in terms of, Chair, the overall performance then in the awards that were given, how does the, how does the Northern Ireland overall results compare under this system of moderation than in, in previous years? Well, what we've seen in relation to that is that at um, A level, uh, we saw an increase of um, just under two percent. Yeah, just under two percent, uh, and that, you know, depending, as I said, on what way you want to uh, judge things on, on that basis. So let's take, if you take maybe a different level of it, at the the highest possible point uh, this year, there was nine point eight percent of entries got an A star. Last year, it was eight point eight. Uh, you know, you can you can take if you like any gradation. Obviously, the, the principal thing is quite often a star to C is what is is looked at, and there was uh, an increase of just under two percent as regards that. At the very lowest end, um, roughly speaking, the the percentage getting a U at A level went down from one point seven percent to zero point nine percent. We had one hundred and ninety three uh, awards that were at U level within uh, within the A level grade. That's down from roughly about 350, I think, the previous year. Similarly, I think um, was that there will tend to be at AS level because there will be some students who, after AS level, will, you know, leave school, will drop out, etc. 
Um, so you'll always get a higher percentage of use at, at uh, AS level. We have a situation there where it went down from about 4.5% to 3.6%. And similarly across the board in terms of the AS levels, the overall increase on the A to C was up 2.2% uh, from basically 75 to 77%. Uh, percent. And again, at each grade, there, there was that, that progression of, of improvement. So there was a, an upwards trend throughout. Uh, and as I indicated perhaps earlier, we uh, more markedly, to some extent, <coughs> A level, but more markedly, AS level. The non selective schools at AS level improved their results at a significantly greater rate than, than uh, grammar schools. In, in, uh, at AS level, grammar schools went up on average 1.7% overall. Um, in non-selective schools, it went up 7.3%, which is a, is a very large bit. And uh, while the gap is still there, as was it roughly speaking, reduced, reduced the gap by about 30% between uh, between selective and non-selective schools as well. Jerry, can I ask you? Yep. Nor Last Nor question, Robin. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Northern Ireland is always particularly proud of the results of, of our students yeah. when compared against other parts of the United Kingdom. Can I ask you, and I know, I don't know how you do the comparison this year, but in terms of our predicted, to, sorry, in terms of our results this year, how will we compare against England, Scotland and Wales? Well, I think we were, we were ahead of all of them. That's also on the basis, I think, of both uh, selective and non-selective schools being, being ahead in connection with that. Obviously, uh, there has been particularly an intervention in Scotland, which has... Um, uh, altered the figures significantly. I think Scotland has had, there have been concerns raised for many years in Scotland that the, the educational performance is not as good as it should be. I think it would be, a, maybe that's the sort of reason. I don't know, Fistina, if you have any other... Um, we're still ahead of England and Wales, about the same per number of percentage points as we would have been in past years. So it's about eight or nine yes, on percentage the... points um, at A star to C. Um, so we have stayed ahead. So I think that is something to congratulate our students on as well, that we continue not, to not outperform not, the How does it compare to Scotland, given the changes in Scotland? Well, we're certainly not comparing like with like, because apart from anything else, they don't have A-levels in Scotland. They have hires. So okay. to some extent, when the comparisons are done, you know, we tend with, a, there's bits of variations, but broadly speaking, to be on a similar, uh, there's, a, there's a similarity which you can do, comparability with England, Wales and Northern Ireland, Scotland, obviously, as well, it has entirely its own education system okay. um, since actually pre pre union in that in that regard. Right. So, to some extent, it it, it is okay. very difficult for it to compare its figures in okay. any year with with yeah. uh, with England. Thanks, I Robin. think overall, Thank almost all our students pass their A level, so we have practically a one hundred percent pass rate at A level. So that okay. is really impressive for us. Thank our you, students as well. Robbie Butler, MLA. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Minister, for attending and the, the, your team from the department. Um, like yourself and like the rest of the committee, I do want to congratulate the students who have got the grades that, uh, that they are entitled to uh, work towards, and I wish them every success. But I also want to make a, a commitment and a promise to those students who are suffering at the moment that uh, I and the, this committee will do our best, um, and hopefully to work with yourself, Minister, to bring a, a speedy resolution and a fair resolution. Um, yesterday, I, I spent all day, as most of us will have done, speaking to school principals. And one of the things that shocked me mm -hmm. was that in speaking to every school principal that I did, not one of them gave a uniform or a response as to what they believed to be uh, the standardisation model and how uh, it would be used to, to grade the students. I, I, I definitely three distinct different suggestions of what it would be. And I'm sure you'd agree with me, Minister, that our principals are some of the cleverest people. Um, uh, that we have when we charge them with uh, responsibility for our students. Um, that being the case, and, and coupled to that, listening to some of the interviews and taking part in some of the debates this week, there seems to have been a shift in the model. Now, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was put to us, uh, starting at the start of this week, that it was a data-rich model, data -rich model uh, that the teachers' assessments, the AS grades, and there was a I think there was an emphasis put on that this week, and there was less emphasis put on the rank order and uh, that statistical modelling. And the question was repeatedly asked, and the answer wasn't given. What is the weighting to each component part? And I would suggest that if the weighting was given to the rank order, then that would be the fundamental flaw in 
this system. Um, I won't give any individual examples because we've been inundated and some have already been given with regard to some schools and a lot of individuals who will have been, and, and the appease process could remedy that. But I'm going to suggest to you, Minister, that, and I think you've already made a reasonable commitment in that, if the appease shows, for instance, that the AS result indicated that the grade could have been better, that that would be the outcome. No, I, I've indicated it's one of Minister, the Minister, can I really briefly? Robbie, there's a really good question in there that um, I hope you're putting mm -hmm. as a question with regards to what percentage weighting was given to yeah. each component part. So hopefully so that, that is something you're asking for. Yeah, yep. That, that's the first question. Um, question mark at the end of the weighting. So we've, we've asked for that repeatedly and has been asked for. Really, really need to see that. And I think it's been asked enough times for, the evidence, for it to be there, uh, Minister. Yeah. The, the, the piece on. Um, sorry, Chair. Um, just in there Sorry, I just, that was a good question. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. With regard to then the, the AS results, and, and there is data there. I mean, there's, there's a Durham University uh, piece on it that shows how statistically accurate AS results are. It, it would indicate that between 50 and 60 percent of results are accurate to the grade, and there's a 20 to 25 discrepancy both up and down. And students accept that. Our students are not asking for something that they're not entitled to. There are winners and losers in exams, and we know that. This just needs to be the most fair and just system. Um, I'm just going to finish this out, Chair, by giving you a, a, and I don't mean to be funny, I'm not being facetious when I say this, the most interesting phone call I had came last night from a farmer, and they, they've been listening in because of their grandchildren that are in, involved in the process, and they said this system that seems to have been selected sounds like the Signet system, used for grading sheep and beef. And what happens with that is, uh, in terms of that, it's not the value of the ram. Mm -hmm. It is where it comes from and how valuable the stock was before that ram appeared. It's not measured on the index of that particular that's ram a student. It is, so where is the fairness? Where is the fairness? And, and the very last point is this. When I look back, and, and we did pick it up in the committee, Minister, that the appeals process, um, CCEA, rejected some of the suggested changes and it's, it's in the consultation and they robustly stuck to it. They've already moved and I thank them that they have moved. Does that not indicate that not only was it flawed from the start but we need to really exercise uh, haste in rectifying this and perhaps I'm just asking you for this because um, you've said we use a, a three country model. Our students, I think about 5,000 of our students a year go across to England, Scotland and Wales and they're going to be competing both here and there, their Scottish and Welsh and English counterparts. Fair is fair and I, would not, I do not want to see our students here disadvantaged because of what the Welsh Minister or the Scottish Minister or the English Minister do. Well, okay, to pick up on a couple of those points, most to, um, more of an agricultural background Robbie I think than, than, than I would have or maybe uh, in touch with others. I, I suppose to use the uh, analogy, the issue which is a level of standardisation which has to happen in terms of the past results, the, the performance of that school, although indicating with the, also the mean GCAs, will be a factor within AS levels, although it's also indicated that the formula that we are using then that as, as children move on there will be the opportunity in 2021 either then for, um, for their A level to be purely based, it, it, it won't if you like, unlike previous years, because it's, you know, this is, at best, this is not going to be as good a result as, a, as an examination, as, as robust a result. So therefore, in 2021, for the A-levels, the, the AS results from 2020 will not feed into that, but there will be the opportunity either for those to be sort of back-calculated, which would be the norm, or B, um, for a, a reset in terms of, of AS. But in terms of the, the, the RAMs analogy or the beef analogy, uh, where the RAM came from, what the RAM was in the past or whatever is no bearing at all on A levels, no past performance right. from the point of view of the school. I, and, yeah, and I think I, I appreciate that. On the, um, on the issue you mentioned in relation to uh, the AS's, yes, AS's will have clearly a level of bearing, they've also had a particular bearing on, on the A level result. They can go up and they can go down. That is why AS's is one of the key pieces of evidence that can be used in relation to it. And you make a point that not wanting rightly not wanting to see Northern Ireland students disadvantaged compared to their compatriots. That is why in many ways what we're doing is uh, of a very similar nature to England, but actually we're going slightly further than England. They have said that mock uh, 
uh, examination results can be used as evidence in the appeal. It is, to quote uh, an official from, from England, it is not an automatic assumption that that changes the, uh, the A-level results, but it is one of the factors. But we're going slightly wider than that in saying that any evidence of prior attainment now is part of the process by which schools will have, for example, gathered data. Um, they, they, will, they should have some level of information on each individual student. So that is something that can be forwarded. Other prior attainments that are there can be used. So, you know, in that sense, we're, we're taking a more expansive bit and a more opportunistic bit. Minister, to, what percentage weighting was given to each component part of the CA grade calculation? In terms of, in terms of the rank bit, it, it's not as straightforward as that because the rank bit is not a percentage bit. It is, you get a, a uh, depending upon which particular formula uh, or the, the bit that is used, for instance, on the A-level side of it, that produces a statistical distribution. The distribution is then applied to the rank, rank order. So the rank order is vital, but it's not a percentage side of it. It's, it's, it's a different concept in that, in that regard. And in the terms rank of, order is vital, though, you're saying? Yeah. Oh, it is, yes, absolutely vital. So, I mean, like, let's take a, an obvious example. If there are 100 people in a, in a class, irrespective of, of what the overall generation of grades are, it should be a situation, you know, clearly if you're one or you're 100, makes night and day of difference in that, in that regard. So it's not, a, it's not a percentage side of things. That's, that's why it's uh, put in, in connection to that. Probably in terms of some of the, the detail in terms of the algorithm. It probably, okay. and look, if there's any information that we have that, that would be of value, well, we will certainly... Daniel obviously asked it. for the algorithm to be uh, provided to us so we can do that. Robbie, I'll bring you back in for supplementary. Okay, well, but can we, I we can also specifically provide, ask you, Minister, in, in yeah. supplement to what um, you, Robbie has sure. asked, what engagement have you had with Scottish, Welsh, English education ministers regards a more standardised UK response to the challenges that have been faced with great awards? Well, we have, uh, there's been fairly consistent discussion uh, that has taken place, um, certainly in the run up to this, over a number of months on this and a range of other, particularly education or COVID challenges that are there in terms of Four Nations conferences. And that happens at both the, uh, well, I suppose there's two layers to this. It happens at both the ministerial level it happens at the um, it happens at the the officials level, and also as regards the qualification side of it, particularly with the overarching body of Ofqual, all our qualifications bodies are in fairly constant um, discussions. That is particularly in what might be described as the three nation model, but also sometimes involves the, the Scottish qualification. Have, have, have you had recently spoken to those Scottish Welsh English education ministers with regards to? standardising uh, well, the UK I've, response I've to this look, challenge? I've, I've certainly spoken to the UK Minister, Gavin Williamson, in, in, in relation to that. Um, I think that, that particularly, and you know, if you like, prior to results, I've spoken to, to, John, uh, to John Swinney, to Kirsty Williams. You know, so there are dialogue okay. going on. And there's also between the, uh, both the, the regulators and indeed the exam boards, there okay. is a, a fairly constant dialogue that goes in. And while, if you like, the Scottish are in a slightly different position, they are plugged in at times to that conversation yeah. as well. Okay. Robbie, do you want a brief supplementary? Yeah, I'll yeah. just come in. So, uh, Minister, I know that you have recently uh, established a task force to look at education and achievement, so yep. I do believe it is one of your priorities. But the most recent academic document that has been produced at Strand Millis indicates that uh, the scale of our education and achievement uh, is masked by the cohort of high achievers. So there's no doubting that year on year we hear about our high achievers, which is welcome. However, in terms of numbers, the, the, the industry experts tell us that that masks the underachievers. And I think in this case, it's another example of where that has happened. Um, and, and rightly, when you come in, you, you tell, told us about the success, and you should. But I think that masks the hidden, um, the, the hidden problems. And for some of those people, and this is why I want to push you more on the, the appeals, uh, those people who are less likely to appeal are those that are less likely to have the information and from, I would suggest, from socially deprived mm -hmm. backgrounds. And that's why I think your standard and your benchmark must be A2, or sorry, AS results as a minimum and to ensure that our pupils aren't disadvantaged. And I'm, I'm going to have a pressure on this even outside of here, Minister, because there are people who will fall through the cracks. And the value of a society is in how you treat the vulnerable and those that don't have the information. So we need to be aiming for our, th 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 those that, th 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 that are likely to fail. I would have suggested also that 193 to get used is 193 too many. And I don't mean that to be glorious in any way. Those, every student that took part in this didn't have a chance to lift themselves up in the last six months through no fault of their own. With people getting furlough payments, we've got businesses getting rates breaks, we've got lots of help from the government. We're saying, well, what help is the government going to give 
each and every student, because this is a different cohort, Minister, and I know you have a heart for students. So I'm, I'm actually I'm talking to your heart here, but just I'm not so just to finish. Fair enough, yeah. okay. Just to finish, yep. Secondary Students Union um, have established a petition. There's over 1,100 signatures on it within 15 hours. It'll be landing on their desk, and that, that's that's the, 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 the group that are going to really drive this. Now, what they're also interested in is the GCSEs. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask you, will, will schools primarily or exclusively focus on a three-year performance ranking? Uh, with regard to that, because that's next week, and, and, okay. and that's going to be really okay. Important. Supplement that briefly, Robbie. In addition to the question Robbie asked about GCSEs, do you know the GCSE results? Uh, in addition to Robbie's question, uh, well, I suppose there's, <laughs> there's two, well, two issues in this. So I'll say a little bit. Uh, no, I don't know the GCSE results because they're not out yet. We would get a closer to the time with each of A levels, AS levels, and GCSEs. We will get. Uh, a level of briefing on what the results will be, but that tends to be relatively close to the time at which they are revealed. It is also the case that when those figures, because those are done as well on both a local and a national basis, that in terms of the results that uh, would be there, that is on a confidential basis, which is embargoed. So I don't know the results, but even if I did know the results, I couldn't uh, tell you in, in relation to that. and that's the same each year, if you forgive me in, in connection with that. Uh, Robbie, to pick up, I suppose, just uh, your point towards the end in terms of particularly underachievement in secondary schools. The, the issue and in terms of GCSE, you had a particular Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry, yeah, I'll, I'll deal yeah. with the, uh, GCSEs. Yeah. I'll deal with the, the three aspects. Right, in terms of secondary schools, the point that has been made in terms of these results, and we will see, because I can't obviously second guess precisely what will be there in terms of GCSEs, both A levels. And the AS levels compared to last year, uh, secondary schools, non-selective schools, did comparatively better than grammar schools. The gap in both A level and particularly significantly in AS level narrowed, which is showing an improving picture as regards that. You talk about the success at the top end masking the success, the failure at the bottom end. Uh, and that is there's always a danger within that. What I would say is this year. Uh, there has been a fewer number of pupils getting the lowest grades, at 0.9% uh, getting a U grade, 3.6% of those at AS level. Uh, you know, I, I don't have the comparative figures throughout, throughout time. I suspect that is probably the lowest figure that we have ever had, certainly the, the lowest to, to my knowledge. So, so it's, oh, sorry? I still think it's 193 too many. Well, no, look, look, I mean, but look, but by the same token, you, you can't have any exam system which then guarantees that everybody is going to pass. It wasn't an exam system, to be fair, to finish it. Well, okay, that, okay, that, you can't have a qualification system which then says, and they, it would devalue a qualification system as saying, we will guarantee that everybody will pass. You know, constantly we've got to actually drive down those numbers, and there has been a level of success in relation to that. The formula in terms of GCSEs takes account of the three-year performance of the school. It is weighted so that, um, uh, this is within particular subjects, it is weighted so that greater emphasis is put on the more recent years, because the obviously argument is, and this has been a case from quite a lot of particularly secondary schools, that uh, they are seeing improvements, they are doing improvements, and it's right that those, therefore those are reflected. And what happened in 2019 is more relevant to what happened in 2017. There will also then be a component of what the national result is. That will mean then that perhaps some schools that have uh, in the past not performed as well will, will actually be slightly raised in terms of their, uh, in terms of their performance. Uh, that will then produce a uh, statistical data for, uh, for that school, for that individual um, cohort within, say, history or geography, to which then the ranked list would be uh, applied. I think the problem, particularly at GCSE level, is the further down the school age you go, the less robust the data is. And at GCSE level, for individual performance, there is nothing that, is, that can be um, any level of, of robust individual data which can apply across the system, because earlier testing, uh, before it gets to GCSEs, um, will tend to be... Um, it, you know, it, it'll not be as, as robust between <laughs> schools um, as... Well, as we haven't had statutory assessment. We haven't had statutory that assessment. That would be what we would use traditionally, and obviously we don't have any statutory assessment at Key Stage 3 at the moment. Mm -hmm. But this is, I mean, this is a handout from um, a webinar which SIA did.
um, earlier this week for school principals and we will send that to you because it does give a straightforward and I think quite user friendly description of how each of the models worked, although obviously you're, you want the more detailed algorithm, but this does, I think, treat with each, or treats each of the three areas and explains them um, and that was attended by about, I think, 150 principals to, to listen to see it explaining the process and exactly how it worked on Tuesday of this week, but we can forward those um, handouts and the slides to the committee. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Robbie. Thank you. Um, Catherine Kelly, MLA. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, yesterday morning at 8 a.m., many of our young people's hopes were dashed um, and their futures devastated. Um, devastated by an algorithm. Um, and apologies if, if I'm repeating myself or repeating what other people have said, but this algorithm has generated inconsistent and erratic results, which in turn has discriminated against many high achieving pupils from disadvantaged areas. Consequently, um, from this, I have sought input from the Human Rights and Equality Commission um, in order for them to provide clarity and guidance around it. Um, my office, like my committee colleagues, was inundated yesterday with angry and frustrated young people, principals, parents. How, after the devastation that this has caused, can you defend the system used? A system that was flawed from the outset and is seriously detrimental to the mental health and well-being of our citizens. The Scottish Minister did not hesitate to right this wrong. Why can you not show the same leadership and ensure that our young people are at the absolute heart of decisions made moving forward? At, oh, sorry. At, at this stage, do you have an understanding yet to the extent of the downgrading which took place between um, non-selective schools compared to selective? Okay, so yeah, go ahead, Minister. Catherine, what I've said, first of all, in terms of downgrading, nobody look, there is a inaccuracy. Like nobody has been downgraded because they didn't have that degree. This is not a question of here's an award which is then being reduced. That is not the case. It is the same as has happened in other years in terms of uh, teachers have given their assessments and there has been a difference between what teachers have said in relation to it. What I would indicate in terms of the situation as regards selective and non-selective schools is that, no, that under this system, and this system, I'm not, no one is suggesting this system is perfect because the better solution would have been for exams to take place, but that was not able to happen anywhere. So anything is always going to be a level of substitute for the examination system itself. But uh, pupils at non-selective schools did better compared to their counterparts in grammar schools than they did last year or the year before. The level of, of attainment gap that is there in terms of A-levels and AS-levels closed this year to, an extent, uh, to a greater extent than would have been in previous years. So from that point of view, there is no particular evidence of any level of discrimination. Where there are clearly individual cases that, that can be put in, into place, Maybe. that is where the, the robust appeals system should be. And you say about the Scottish Minister stepped up to the mark, they, they did the right thing. I think the Scottish decision was wrong, Maybe. because I think the credibility of a system which suddenly then just uh, at a stroke, uh, which creates no level of level playing field for individual, um, for individual students and shifts it uh, up automatically, somewhere between 10 and 14 per cent, and indeed those are percentage points rather than, um, you know, rather than in fact, you know, you're actually improving, you look at it a slightly different way, um, you're adding sort of 15 or 20 per cent uh, to the, the numbers that are, that are there in place. I don't think that is correct. It is not one also which gives fairness between students, because I indicated as well that different teachers, and it is human nature, some teachers, some groups will have uh, produced, um, in terms of their assessment, have been produced a, a more optimistic or a more lenient uh, view in terms of things than other teachers or other groups. So you would then be in a situation where effectively, depending upon which teacher was looking at, at, um, at your particular uh, situation, which school you were at, would actually determine, and indeed their judgment call simply, 
which differs from, from teacher to teacher, from center to center, um, it would not create any level of equality for people. Okay, Minister Catherine, we're, we're running slightly over time. If I could ask you for a, a brief supplementary and then I'll, I'll try and get a, a question from Justin and, and Morris for the minister to respond to, Catherine. Can I just um, come back just, just for one second here? Um, at, at the heart of all of this are young people. Um, and, and I think we tend to forget about that when we talk about numbers and grades and, and systems and all of the rest of it. We have young people here today absolutely devastated. Young people who were predicted by their teachers who are the professionals in all of this. And we need to remember that. Um, not an algorithm, not a mystery algorithm that we still don't have any clarity on. Um, and Minister, have you any plans to actually speak to young people? Are you going to listen to them and take on board why they are so angry and confused and have zero faith or confidence now in our education system? Are you going to explain to our, our AS students that even though they worked harder than they ever have before, that because their school wasn't high achieving, that they have now been disadvantaged? It is your responsibility to restore that faith and reverse the shambles. OK, yes, Catherine, I'll say two things, particularly as regards to the A-levels. Either the past performance of a school in terms of its you know, call it sort of academic reputation or its results has no bearing whatsoever on A-levels. So let's, let's nail that bit as well. I talked to, to um, A-levels, I talked to various students, teachers, you know, every day of my life in, in relation to that. It is a situation that if, if we're saying about explaining as, as it's termed downgrading, if we applied the same position last year, 40% of grades were lower than what actually their teachers predicted. They would effectively, on, if we use the same language, have a 40% downgrade last year. The same applies in other jurisdictions as well. So the position that, that the children are left in, it is always incredibly disappointing um, where someone doesn't get the grades they are either hoping for or expecting. And that is, that can be, it is not the end of the story, however. You're right, I think, uh, one of the points I would agree with you, we are talking here about young people, we are talking about individuals. That is why in every individual case where there is a, a case to be answered, where there is evidence of prior attainment, that can be then looked at and appealed in every single individual and dealing with individual cases with individual children is a better solution than trying to say, let us, let us put in some... Um, system fix, which will actually discriminate against some and benefit others. Okay. Um, can I, Justin and Morris, I'll take re two really short questions for you, Minister. I realise we need to let you get away. Oh, I understand that. Uh, yeah. Justin, a, a question, and I'll take a question from Morris and then let the Minister respond. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, Minister. Minister, you're, you're remarkably calm given the crisis that we're in and given the trauma of people's parents, teachers, principals are experiencing. The futures of those people is in jeopardy here and their dreams are at stake. So I would just say you're, you're remarkably calm given that those circumstances. I'm getting swamped like other, like my colleagues in committee um, by, from parents, pupils, teachers, and principals um, who are really, really um, at crisis point stations, not understanding what the hell is going on here. Pupils are contacting me saying, what is the point in going to school and studying for years when no allowance is, is given to your efforts? A principal's been in contact this morning um, from Armagh, um, and you know the teacher assessment has been demonstrated. You've said earlier in this uh, committee that teacher, um, professional teacher assessment has been demonstrated to be not in line with what the actual results are. I may be paraphrasing there, Minister, but that's what the, the gist of what you said. Why did we bother asking the teachers to go through a rigorous process of uh, producing centre assessment grades when, in essence, now they feel like they have been totally ignored? The data that we've seen from RMA, from RMA CBS, which is a non-selective school, and they've been discriminated against. You talked about the um, gap has been reduced. Well, I, I would like to see the evidence that the, the, their scores have not been uh, reduced more than the selective schools. 82 students studied um, in year 14. One student had improved grades. 11 students had grades that remained the same. That's 13%. 70 students had grades decreased. That's 85%. 85% had grades increased. Subjects, 24 subjects in total in year 14. One subject had improved grades. Four subjects had grades that remained the same. That's 16%. 19 subjects had grades that decreased. 
exam entries. We had 236 entries in total in year 14. Seven centre assessment grades were improved grades, 3%. 108 centre assessment grades remained the same, 46%. 121 centre assessment grades decreased to 51%. So there's a massive, massive decrease there in numbers. Um, but a, a, just a, a quick question. How can you say, Minister, that the uh, professional teacher assessment has been demonstrated to be not in alignment with what the actual results are? If that is the case, why did you ask them for their their professional uh, uh, um their professional opinion on what the results are of the, the, the students who they know um, very well and hear really well. Why do you ask them? Thanks, Justin. Okay. Thanks, Justin. Respond to that. Look, uh, first of all, in terms of the, uh, I've indicated in terms of awards, if you compare what teachers have assessed in terms of their grades with uh, what the grades were, there is a gap. But that's the same as last year, uh, it's the same as 2018. Teachers are asked for. Um, their professional judgment in terms of grades every year. It is, it's not just unique to this year. We are probably unique in Northern Ireland in that that has been done for a number of years where it hasn't. Where it has played a particular role is in the basis of the ranking, and that's where the, the, the teacher assessment has come into play. In terms of calmness, like I, I'm very aware of the emotions that, that are around this, um, and as with everybody in this issue, I care deeply. I think it is important that we try and deal with this uh, with, with cool heads as, as, as much as possible and uh, if I was getting into a sort of a shouting match or uh, ill temper I don't think that's going to be helping anybody either in, in relation to that. In terms of improvement, the improvement for um, students across the board but particularly for those in secondary is comparing their actual results in 2020 with their actual results in 2019. That has shown that th that has increased and that is I think from that point of view, the relevant statistic which, which is in, in place. Minister, before we, you move off, to what extent does this uh, process discriminate against boys? Well, there's no evidence that it does discriminate against boys. What we've said in terms of the results... Do you the initiative, Minister, in terms of addressing educational opportunity within boys? To what extent does this process discriminate against the boys who are last lap uh, sprinters, but very often in relation to exams, boys do not, are not as diligent in right terms, there, right because of the process, to what extent is this process yeah. discriminated against boys? In, in terms of, like, if there's a wider issue of, term, of how boys perform in examinations or perform in the examination system, uh, you know, th there is a wider consideration that probably needs to be taken, as that's maybe a debate for another day. What we are suggesting in terms of this particular system, there is a gap between what girls achieved and what boys achieved. But the patterns of that gap are pretty much the same as they've been in any other year. That is a wider systemic problem than this particular formula. This formula, this formula, this, these actions. I th look, I think objectively it is, it's clearly the case. Okay. It neither. Uh, there may well be a good argument. There's a particular problem there, but it, I think it is fair to say that it neither um, ameliorates that, that that problem or worsens it. Okay, Justin, sorry. I'm going to bring Morris in just to get a, a final question. Uh, the Minister's been generous with his time. Morris? Morris mm -hmm. Bradley? Yeah. yeah, thank you, Chair. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, thank you very much for coming to the party today. Um, I thank all the other committee members for their contributions. I think it's been very, very helpful to get a lot of the issues aired. But a lot of young people have had dis disappointing results yesterday. I think more than, than normal. Uh, young children right across Northern Ireland have been awarded grades that could have certainly not have been predicted based on previous results of school. Uh, an example would be a pupil of a high level of attainment throughout school receiving a grade well below their expected level. And I've also been contacted by parents whose children have changed schools. We seem to have had uh, no regard taken for levels of attainment in the previous schools. Uh, previews of A's and B's have been awarded as, as in some cases U's. So therefore, can I ask the Minister to urgently review the current appeals process to widen the scope of criteria to allow uh, more appeals to reflect all aspects of previous school attainment so that unexpected low grades can be recognised and adjusted where necessary? Okay. Did you get that, Minister? Yeah, I, yeah. I did. I know, I know the, sound, the sound quality wasn't, wasn't great, but I think I picked up the gist of that. Uh, look, uh, look, I would reiterate, first of all, in terms of the levels of achievement, there have been fewer people getting lower grades this year. The grades are overall up. And as most specifically as regards to somebody who has changed schools, uh, as indicated in terms of the 
the A-level position in particular, that won't have made any level of difference because it's, uh, uh, there isn't sort of prior achievement at that school. There's, there's no role at all within that. But the specific point that he's made in terms of the appeals, the appeals are being widened. This is the first time in which it is not simply a process issue challenge that can be taken in terms of that. But see, I've indicated, and I'm very supportive of this, um, that uh, the change that will be made this year is specifically to also allow appeals on the grounds of a challenge that uh, prior uh, achievement, prior attainment, has not been properly reflected in the result uh, that has been uh, produced. That is, um, as I said, probably in a similar line to what has happened in England, but is a little bit wider than that because the scope of evidence that can be produced here will be wider. I think England, well, maybe it's wrong to say the pre were their final position because I think they've asked off call to, to do it, but they've specifically tied it in with mock results. Okay. We're wider than that. Minister, is that communicated on the SEA website in relation to appeals? No, I, uh, from that point of view, um, Chair, um, I, I don't know what's absolutely, we, we certainly, in terms of, because it was drawn to our attention that the, that the website, it's obviously a statement that's been made by SEA. I think on the website, certainly as of late afternoon yesterday, it was pointed out that it wasn't um, explicitly, because I think uh, there is a reference, I think, to uh, where an incorrect grade has been done, and, but it's not explicitly. I think we have given, uh, we've indicated to say that they need to change uh, on the, the website and indeed on any information to make that abundantly, abundantly clear. Yeah, Obviously, having, having come straight here this morning, I, I don't know whether between, because okay. I think that conversation took place there, was around about, 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 about yeah. six o'clock last there night. There are obviously a number of urgent issues at that appeal process and admissions to further education, higher education, apprenticeships. Um, it is my understanding that there are some universities, such as Cambridge, willing to stand corrected, mm -hmm. who are advising pupils that they will accept whatever grade they have as of the next 24 hours, 48 hours. Um, ca can you guarantee then that no pupil will lose an offer they've received from any university prior to that September the 7th deadline? Well, that is the, certainly the position of, of UCAS Higher education directly is not within, uh, I mean, we have liaison with them, but they're not, it's not even within my departmental remit. I suppose that makes it thing. Can I give a guarantee yeah. that, that in absolutely every circumstance in every university? No, I can't, but that would okay. go against what has been there by, by UCAS. English students can obviously reset in November. Northern Irish students cannot. Have you any intention to change that? Not at this stage. I think the, the issue is we've made, I should also say as well, I think one of the other things that have been brought in and said before anybody else was that in any appeals process, we also made sure that there shouldn't be any, particularly in mind of, of the, the issue of those from socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, that there will not be any charge to any level uh, of appeal. Um, I, I should also say one concern I think, I think it was maybe Robbie Reese that I forgot to, to deal with, obviously the concern in terms of appeals, appeals are being rooted uh, through the centre assessments, uh, through the schools themselves, who will also have that level of information. So it's not a question of a pupil or a parent effectively being left to float on their own yeah. on that basis. They will receive that level of support from the school, uh, from the school to, to okay. do that. So you know, okay. it's not a question of because I can understand that it would be quite, could be quite daunting to a family to say, well, actually, how do I pull together the evidence, the information, and in that regard, okay. that's not okay. the way it works. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Daniel, do you have a very brief yeah. supplementary? So, so, Minister, just for the sake of clarity, you're going to publish the algorithm, first of all, yes? We'll, we'll certainly give you, I mean, uh, we'll give you all the information. It, that, it that, needs that to be have. understandable and explainable to the public, so it needs to be published as to how you reach the... Cause well, uh, yeah, I, I, all I would say is probably in terms of uh, anything to do with algorithms, Generally speaking, will not be 100%, if you like, un understandable because it will carry a level of technical yeah, we'll uh, level of, of answer to that. But look, okay. there, there the will be no block from, will, from our uh, side. Uh, and so secondly, we'll Minister, the starting. final question. Oh, we can give this as a starting. The final we give, question. We can give that which gives a certain amount of The final question is will you support, a, as I've asked earlier, an independent review into the SIA processes? Uh, I think SIA processes were signed on that basis on it. I think we will see as the appeal mechanism if there is a specific problem that has arisen over processes on that basis. I think that will need to be judged in relation to it, but I don't intend at this stage to have some sort of independent um, review uh, of the, the basis of it. Uh, and in one word, Minister, do you believe, out of everything you've heard and have told over the last course of the, the last few months, and indeed what you've learned yesterday, do you believe that you got this right? Yes, but I'm not, I mean, I don't think anybody judging their own actions is probably always the... Uh, 
uh, is obviously the watertight element of it. People will disagree in that in that regard. Okay. Okay. Mister, thanks for your time today. Okay, and the, um, in terms of the broader restart, we'll, we'll liaise yeah, to see if we can find a. I, yeah, no. I just to emphasise, the school restart is obviously as as equally as urgent as, as these issues. Oh, no, and I, this, and this education committee will make itself available no, to I, you I in whatever and, and slot and you can that, find that early next I'm, week. Yep. I'm, I'm very happy to do that. I'm just okay. obviously highlighting the fact that in terms of timing, obviously because there wasn't anticipated to be a, a exactly. meeting next week, there's been a range of if other you, things that have been uh, put in the diary. But I, look, we, will, we will be happy for... I expect you'll find a slot for the that's education okay. look, committee the, on school restart. The Depart yep. department yep. and yourselves will... will um, Okay. He is in tic tac to find uh, okay. a suitable time. We're very happy okay. to come back. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thank Minister. You. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Clark, would you like to summarise any key actions um, while we bring our next witness okay. in? I think what um, Paul is going to very kindly do is disinfect. No, no disrespect to the Minister. Yeah, um, no so I'll, um, proper procedures. Yep. So I'll have a go here yep. at uh, what I think members said. And yep. uh, this is where uh, the members correct the clerk. So uh, I think the committee wants to write to the Minister record its concerns about the impact on the well-being of children, parents and staff about the, the A-level results uh, situation, uh, ask to see the model, GCSE, ANAS model, particularly the weightings. Um, ask also for, now does the committee want to ask for the timeline for the adoption of the model? Great. Um, do you also want to see the dry run, which they did for 2019, so there must be some kind of Agreed. report on that. Agreed. Um, you could also ask for school by school, a grade by grade breakdown, what they asked for, what they got. Agreed. Because the overall statistics um, are not implying that they're doing anything they shouldn't do, but sorry. A comparative to the previous years, do we see the percentage of fall uh, okay. and, and, and in grade previous years? years. Yeah. I think okay, that's then. something that we can put to see as well. So, yep, agree. Thank you. Also, uh, then I guess the committee is reiterating its support for heavier. Uh, teacher heavier waiting for teacher assessment um, for A levels, and is the committee also question asking um, for the uh, department to bring forward a reset option um, uh, in the autumn for A levels? That, that is a question. I don't know. Just the, the chair asked the question, and also sorry, could I also ask to broadcasting to please bring all the members back into the spotlight um, if they would, so that they're able to contribute this bit. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you, Clark. I think that's a fair summary. Happy to take further uh, suggestions think, from, from Chair, members. Um, yep, go ahead, Daniel. I'm very, very, I'm deeply unhappy, in fact, about the answers that the Minister gave around his assessment of how this model works uh, and what the algorithm looks like. And, you know, to come out with uh, jargon about to, uh, that, that's very technical and people wouldn't understand, but we need to be holding them to account and we need to ensure that the calculations used by SIA. Uh, are accountable and are questioned uh, uh, and are checked. Uh, so, uh, as I, I used the analogy, we check the minister's homework or see his homework, and, and that's exactly what we need to do. Because if there are questions around these calculations, then that pulls into question this entire process and justifies the arguments that we've made today in terms of the concerns raised about the downgrading of grades right across Northern Ireland. Yeah. So um, just a final wee thing. Sorry, Chair. Yes, Clark, go ahead. Uh, does the committee want to indicate its concerns around the GCSE results? Just because yes. yeah. the video yeah. which SIA has provided, and that's all that I've seen as well, it seems to indicate that it will take previous school performance into account. You can yep. understand why they're doing it, but the impact mm -hmm. might be yep. unknown. Well, it's unknown. I have, yeah, Clark, thanks for that. I have members, I, I have no intention of, of dividing the committee as such today, but. I think we are in exceptional circumstances. Sure. I think there is a potentially exceptional urgency um, at play here um, in terms of progression to other pathways. Um, and GCSE results are pending in less than a week. I did propose earlier, and I would make it a, a proposal for action that this committee does adopt a position in support of pupils receiving either their AS level grade, their teacher SF grade, or their C awarded grade, whichever is highest. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I would support that. The, the minister did, he, he, he tried to repeat that, but he said it slightly off. He said the lowest grade, but it, yeah. it, is, it obviously has to be the highest, the, the highest grade yeah. that has been predicted there. Similar to the triple lock system, is it? I, I'm happy for members to respond to that. I realise that is a uh, a departure from the model and content to give people an opportunity to respond to that. Right. Thank yeah, you. Robin. Right. Thank you, Chair. And I, uh, I don't think I could support that in terms of that uh, this process, which has still some distance to run, uh, needs to be exhausted before any decisions of that nature could, in fact, be 
be fully agreed across the committee, I imagine. Okay. C can I just... Robbie? Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with Robin, except to say this, that some of the things that the committee will be reporting back to the department and the minister are going to take time. And time is not what we have. I mean, I've had an indication mm -hmm. this morning, for instance, I know that, said that UCAS had said that, that grades will be handled until the 7th of September or something like that, and they may extend them further. But I've also had an indication that Queen's University aren't going to do that, and that some universities may not do that. And time is of the essence here. So my suggestion would be that if we can agree something that goes forward, that the, the pieces of work that are prioritised is an agreed approach from the committee um, appealing to the minister to take an action. And, and I have a reason for that, because we've got the GCSEs coming up next week. Yep. We're going to have Justin Edwards in next. And, and one of the questions some, someone, it'll either be me or someone else from the committee, will ask, in the event of thousands of appeals, which it literally could be thousands, and I expect it will be thousands of appeals, how long is that going to take? Are we going to be looking at October, yeah. November, December before some students get the results? And fundamentally, that doesn't need to happen when we have two yeah. parts of the United Kingdom already taking action. We need to. We need to. Yeah. See I'm going to. I'm going to. Did move us on here because um, yeah. we we need to and I ask members to. Um, Chair, you, this is a critical point. Yeah. Uh, no. No. I'm going to. I'm going to come yeah, back to it yeah. here. So um, we're we're yeah. going to have to vote on this as a committee. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, but I don't what I want to for Robin, but I disagree with him. No. No. I'm, I'm going to do that. But we with with respect, what I wanted to say was. Um, ask members to sustain their energy here. We need to question Sia in the same way we have questioned the minister. Before yeah. we do that, I, I do think um, this merits a vote. Um, I think in the time that we have available here, it would be meritorious for this education committee to be able to say mm -hmm. we proposed this in response to this situation. And I am putting for a vote a proposal that the committee um, position to the minister is that pupils are awarded their AS level grade, their teacher assessed grade, or their CA awarded grade, whichever is the highest. Yeah. I'm content for us to move to a vote on that matter. Well, is that appropriate, do, Clark? Do, do members, um, do, do, can, do members want to discuss? Do they have any views on that before we go to vote? Well, I, I think, Chair, this is a critical point. People are looking to us today to show the leadership that has been lacking from the ministry and from uh, CA. Uh, and they're looking to us collectively to come out and say a wrong has happened here and we are moving very swiftly to put it right. And I think that the action, the course of action that you propose is very difficult to argue with, Chair, because okay. it provides a series of options okay. for us to consider that okay. would alleviate the pressure on young people and fix this problem okay. immediately. I'm just got, we, need to, we really do need to move on. So, Karen uh, Mullen, uh, MLA. I also agree with the course of action. I called on the Minister to take a similar approach yesterday. So we would be happy to do that um, as discussed. It is not the same as other years, so we do have to do something different. Yeah. Okay. Well, Robin, you want to come back in and or Morris? It's just much too premature, Chair, to take that. There is a process to be adhered to, in my opinion. I think we should follow that process and uh, the results of that process. And okay. perhaps at a later stage, the suggestion you're making could, could be implemented. Okay. Uh, that's a, I think that's a fair hearing of positions, yeah. I think. I think. Say, yes, Justin. Um, given that crisis, that similar crisis occurred in Scotland, where the First Minister stepped in immediately to hands up and say, everyone will address this, and given that we're not seeing that leadership from our First Minister, and given that we're not seeing that leadership from our, our Minister for Education, I fully agree with your proposal that with this, the highest uh, grade should be awarded. Uh, so, I, Robbie, briefly. Um, I, I, I would caveat this to, I, I would be fully supportive, but I actually, um, in the interest of the, the broader subset of students, I think that the other action for this is for the Minister to liaise with the four devolved Ministers and see if they can't come also agree an agreed process to make it fair to all. Happy to add that to the proposal, yeah. Um, I, I, I think that's a fair wind of positions. I think there is a committee position in favour of that. I'm happy to put it to a vote if necessary. And of course, properly, transparently note the, my, the, the other position from Morris and Robin um, that it is too premature to do that. Do we need to take a vote on that? Sure, I propose we take a vote on that. Okay. Okay, so members in favour, you need yep, to say yep. Clark, happy for me to say it? Yep, yep, me members of favor, in favour of the committee adopting a position um, for the Minister to award pupils either their AS level grade, teacher assessed grade or C awarded grade, whichever is highest, and to call on the Minister to engage with his UK and Ireland counterparts to work towards a standardised approach on this matter. Members in favour? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, against? Sorry. Yeah, uh, Morris. There's one. 
Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm not saying this one because I think okay. the children come first. Okay. Fair enough, fair enough. Sorry, so I'm wrong. Okay. One fair enough. And fair one enough. Extension. So okay. the motion is carried. Sir. Content, clerk. Yeah. Yep. Motion okay. Carried. I'm conscious that we need to move to our next yep. agenda item. Is that appropriate, clerk? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. If we can bring in our next next witnesses, thank you. Members finding the temperature is it uh, hot or cold? It's okay. Okay, it's warm. Really bad. Yeah, but the windows were opened, so yes, thank goodness. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Justin. 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 Hey, Presentation made available. Mark, do you know what page that's on? It's page 78, members. Page 78. That's a, a presentation for our reference from SAFE for this morning. Um, if I could welcome Justin Edwards, Chief Executive of SAFE, and uh, Ms. Margaret Farrar, Director of Education at SAFE. Um, our can I advise witnesses that proceedings will be reported uh, by Hansard, as I have done, refer members to page 78 of their packs for presentations from SIA and JCQ, and invite uh, Justin to make an opening statement. Thank, thank you. you. For, thank you very much, Mr Chairman, and thank you, Committee, for the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Um, I'm conscious that um, the, the Committee will want to get into details of the approach in terms of the award this year what I thought I'd do to the committee is uh, do with the committee is lay out um, the the results um, as of the a level and a s level yesterday uh, and um, explain uh, some of the changes that we've seen in the opening statement obviously just to set the context um, this was an exceptional year was an exceptional year in that examinations were cancelled probably for the first time in living memory. They were cancelled on the 20th of March to uh, protect young people, and teachers, invigilators, those who work with the examination process and part of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, that left us with a position of um, no examinations and having to seek an alternative. And we were directed essentially to achieve two things. One, to give young people the grades and the 13th of August by issue of results day so that they may progress in their education, they may progress in their journey through life and, um, and through work. But also that in giving those grades that we would maintain as far as possible the standard with previous years in order to maintain the value um, of those qualifications. Those principles were shared across the um, UK jurisdictions that use the A-level, AS-branded qualifications, and certainly our counterparts in Scotland used similar principles for the higher qualifications that were taken there. In carrying forward those principles, we um, sought a, a series of options. We considered um, a range of options and how we might deliver examinations, and I think it would be fair to say there was no perfect solution. Examinations form the perfect solution, but for us, we knew that wasn't available, so we had to seek the next best option. And we did consider uh, coursework, moderation, validation, um, but we also considered uh, how we would standardise in order to maintain um, outcomes consistent across years. We presented our conclusions on options to SEA Council. Um, SEA Council presented options uh, to the, the Minister in terms of advice, and we were instructed that we should proceed um, with GCSE, AS, and A level qualifications using a combination of teacher judgment um, with statistical standardisation. The teacher judgment component coming from the centres known as centre assessed grades and centre rank orders is two component parts. One is a grade projected by the teacher that the young person would most likely get had the examinations gone ahead. We provided significant guidance to centres, schools, teachers on how they might achieve that. 
In that guidance, we outline the information and evidence that they might consider in that process in order to reach that grade. And we also advised against, um, uh, we advised on how to mitigate uh, bias in those judgments as far as possible. We also asked the teachers to rank order the children, young people in their class groups. And in the rank order, that is the young person that they thought would achieve the highest mark or score would be one, right the way through to the lowest number, uh, the largest number down the rank uh, of that information provided. And that information was submitted to SIA um, by an electronic portal. At this point, Mr Chairman, I would like to thank the education system. Um, without the entire support of every school, every teacher, every principal involved in this process, we could not have collected that data. They worked with us and we had 100% of the submissions by the deadline we set for both GCSE and AS uh, A-level data. And I think that it is fair to say that building this system was not an effort just by SEA, it was an effort by the education system to deal with the circumstances that we faced. From that data, we then carried out modelling, and I'm conscious that the committee may want to get into more detail on that through questioning. But that modelling allows the standardisation to ensure that the results that we gave maintained as far as possible standards over time. And yesterday we were able to release the results of both the AS and A2 outcomes. And in the A2 outcomes, it's fair to say that outcomes increased, and they increased by a proportion larger than I've certainly seen in previous years, and it would be difficult to find a point where they increased by this amount um, in near history. The A star grade, for example, went to 9.8%, a one percentage point increase. The A star to A grade increased by 2.3 percentage points to 33.2, and the A star to E grade rate for A level increased by 0.8 percentage points to 99.1 per cent. I think the point was made in the earlier session by the Minister around the teacher grades and the match to the grades actually awarded by SIA yesterday. And the match rate between the teacher grades submitted by the senders and the actual outcomes that SEER was able to award after standardisation was 57.8%. SEER is in a lucky position, I suppose, in that we have data from previous years where we have asked senders to project outcomes um, for learners. And we were able to look at that historic data and match that against actual outcomes um, at examination level. And it's clear that there was a, a considerable rise in the match between the calculated grade um, provided, the, the CAG as we call it, provided by the senders um, this year in comparison to the projected grades from last year's. I believe that that is testament to the hard work of schools, colleges, teachers and principals in terms of increasing the accuracy of return that was provided to us. I think that um, through all this, we would like to take a moment to um, congratulate those learners who have achieved um, high grades and have achieved um, the grades that they sought to achieve um, and have certificates and, and are able to progress. Um, I recognize that there is challenges in, in regards to the process and I'm sure we will get into that but um, I'm conscious that there are a lot of young people who have received certificates. And as I said before, one of the main aims of our process was to retain the value of those certificates and the value that young people saw in those certificates. In terms of gender, the historically at A level, um, male um, have been outperformed by females. Um, there was only one year, 2018, where that inverted. The gap between males and females at the top grade remained um, only 0.1% uh, wider than in previous years. So we would take that as an indication that the gap between males and females has remained uh, relatively consistent um, over time with the process. We saw some changes in entries. Um, in a normal year, we would comment on such changes. Um, STEM entries increased. And we saw also 
um, small increases in language entries at A level as well. Overall, the entries for A-level remained relatively consistent with previous years, 28,000 approximately, 2019 A-level entries, and 27,791 um, in, in 2021. We are in the process now of, as with a normal year, operating immediately our appeals system, but it is not a normal appeal system because this is not a normal approach to the issue of examination results. We have a dedicated helpline. That helpline has been open from the day before issue results, supporting schools through a challenging process. The A-level results yesterday had the helpline open as well. And the helpline has a telephone number 02890261260 and helpline at sia.org.uk. I'd also like to point out, Mr. Chairman, that for all people seeking um, information on the summer awarding process and details of the summer awarding process, there is uh, further information, including information about our approach to standardization, our approach to appeals, um, and our approach to uh, calculated results at sia.org.uk forward slash summer dash awarding. There are videos which are sign languaged available and there are student guides to the appeals process. If a student wishes to appeal at this stage, um, it is very important that they do so through their school or college. We have worked with the schools or colleges on the appeals process and we would ask in the first instance that a young person makes contact with that school or college to work through the process. Mr Chairman, that introduces an outline of presentation of where we are with the results. I'm quite content to um, refer to the slides as we go through on questioning and take any questions you may have. Okay. Th thanks very much indeed, Justin. And uh, I echo your recognition of the entire education system, including SIA, um, in terms of the hard work and endeavour that has gone um, towards uh, securing outcomes and grade calculations for children and young people across Northern Ireland. Um, the job of this committee is to assess um, how that process has concluded um, or is set to conclude. And I would say again, recognise that the committee did express concern with regards to the statistical model um, that was going to be used to inform the process of awarding the grades in terms of its development um, and aspects of its, its characteristics. Um, you mentioned in your opening remarks there uh, the standardisation modelling. I think a key concern um, amongst many that have materialised further to yesterday is understanding what exactly that standardisation modelling is. Could you speak to that in more detail today? Thank you, Mr Chairman. I uh, certainly will. Um, committee members have been provided with two slide packs, the second of which was a SEA branded slide pack. It's uh, blue slides. And I'll refer to the slides that are, are contained with inside that. Yeah, that's uh, paid for members. Sorry, Justin, that's page 78, Clark. Yeah. It is, yes. Yeah. Thanks, Justin. And between myself and Margaret Farah, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll provide an explanation um, through the slides. So on slide two, um, today, obviously, we're talking about, at this point, um, A-level and AS, because we have the results from those qualifications yesterday. In the A-level qualification, um, we used, as I mentioned before, a combination of centre assessed assessment grades. That is the grade that the teacher believed or projected would the child would most likely occur had examinations taken place. There's a variety of background information provided in order to give that. The rank order, as I've explained before, from one being the highest through. And then the data that we used for the awarding was a combination of the AS level outcomes, the reset data, the sender assessment grades, and the rank order. If it suits the chairperson, perhaps if we deal with the A level model in the first instance and proceed to the AS model, and I'll hand over from the start of slide six, I'll hand over to Margaret, who will explain then the A level model. Yes, okay, thank you, Justin. Um, so I, th I think if, um Colleagues are okay. I'll, I will sort of jump around in the slide deck a little bit, but I'll, I'll direct you to, to where I am. Um, so I think if, if you take a look at slide five, first of all, 
Um, I think that's perhaps helpful to give you a very high level overview for the A-level. Um, so the A-level model does involve, um, as Justin has just explained, um, the use of a lot of information. Um, so centres' um, uh, input was incredibly important. Um, they provided the centre assessment grades for their A-level candidates. Um, and for each centre assessment grade, they rank ordered their students per grade, um, with one being um, the student, if you like, at the top of the ability, um, down to, say, 15. Um, and then the data that we used also involved looking at each individual student's AS qualification uh, results, um, so their grade and their actual um, mark, their uniform mark that they attained, um, also, we were able to build into the model um, where AS uh, level students were resitting uh, their AS or due to resit their AS this summer. We were able to factor that in as we have lots of data available to see um, the likelihood of an improvement um, to a student's AS qualification results. And we felt it was important to build that into the model so that students... Uh, who were due to resit the AS this summer, which would contribute um, to their A-level, um, were not in any way negatively uh, affected this summer. Um, and as you can see, we also then, in the model, use the centre assessment grade and the rank order. I should have perhaps um, started out by saying uh, that, obviously, in Northern Ireland, um, our AS qualification forms 40% of the overall A-level, um, so the A2 part of the A-level being um, 60%. Um, so we are similar to A-levels offered in Wales uh, in that regard, but there is a different policy um, in England. So that's why I think we were very fortunate in Northern Ireland to have a specific model which really um, suited the students of Northern Ireland taking that AS and that A-level qualification. It um, is, I'll, I'll try not to ask too many questions as you're going through, but the, the, the rank ordering approach, is that an approach that is normally used or is this novel to this particular year and model? So um, I guess asking centres to, to rank order their students was a new um, initiative that we had to implement um, this year. Um, as you know, once uh, lockdown was announced uh, at the end of March, we worked um, as quickly as we could to develop new systems and processes to support schools to ensure that students could actually have a grade this year. The aim being, as Justin said, to ensure that all students had a grade that would enable them to progress onto the next step um, in their education or training um, aspirations. Um, so the rank ordering was a, was a new thing that we asked schools to do, but that's why the centre assessment grade was also a really important uh, part of the process um, as schools were then rank ordering um, their students within that centre assessment grade. And I think there is evidence um, to show that, that teachers are very good uh, at rank ordering their students. So in terms of, um, you know, positioning students in terms of their ability, um, you know, that um, we've got evidence to show that that works very well. Um, as we know, with every year when we go through the um, proper exam system, um, you know, in terms of making judgments about grades, that is always quite tricky. Um, and that's why um, each year we um, arrange extensive training um, for our thousands of markers who, even though they mark with us normally every year, it is important to do a lot of standardisation um, to support, you know, the, um, the grades being accurate and the marks being accurate. And obviously, um, under the circumstances that we found ourselves in this year, all of that standardisation um, support wasn't available to teachers who were having to compile centre assessment grades and rank ordering um, within a very tight time frame. Um, to support us in giving the the appropriate can, data. Can I just ask one other brief question? Can can you help us understand how a pupil um, who would be um, in the the B category of the rank order? So the rank order is numerical, and then there are grading sections to that: one to three A star, four to seven A, eight to twelve B. Okay, so how, how a, a candidate who would be in the top 
of the B band, say rank order eight, um, would would finish with a D, and someone who was on the bottom of the rank order of B, say the twelfth candidate, would would remain a B. In reality, it was even wider than that. It was second and twenty first. How, how would how would a circumstance like that have developed? Okay, so I think one thing that that um, has come into play there is that because we um, have used the students' um, actual individual AS marks, um, so uh, we have been able to kind of position them quite carefully in predicting their A-level um, outcomes. Um, and then we have applied the rank order. Um, so, so the CAG has been really helpful in terms of the, um, the teachers' Uh, estimating to the best of their ability where they think um, the student should be in terms of the grading scale um, but we have also obviously been able to use very um, helpful very accurate individual AS level um, data so I think you know there are instances where perhaps the CAG um, looks on paper uh, perhaps to be optimistic in terms of um, where the um, student, um, you know, could be in terms of the grade that they could have got. But if we then look at their actual AS grades and their, um, their mark um, in comparison with all the other students that took that AS qualification and that specific AS unit, um, we can see that actually when we then predict their A-level grade, um, that the grade is lower than the CAG that the teacher perhaps has recommended. Okay. Is that is that? <laughs> it's it, it's challenging to follow, um, and and I, I think it is part of the reason why there is confusion around um, how such a, a difference in rank order. Um, can, can lead to such a difference in outcome final grade. Um, in terms of the, the, obviously concerns have been raised in relation to the rank ordering process as well, um, specifically that it is a challenging approach um, in the absence of what the examinations would have looked like. Um, is rank order, can you point us to other evidence of where rank ordering is a, a sound approach to take in this type of situation? Um, so I think that there is evidence which my, my colleagues um, certainly have drawn upon, to, which suggests that um, you know, uh, you know, rank ordering is very helpful. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking that now that we've got um, results um, and those are available, whilst we've got some diagrammatic sort of depictions of how we've used the model in the slide pack. Um, I'm, I'm thinking now that it could be helpful to sort of give real life examples of how of how the approach has worked and we could do that through animation because you're absolutely right it is it is complicated um, and I think um, perhaps without using real life examples it's hard to kind of get across how all those different things the center assessment grade the rank order <clears throat> excuse me the AS uh, marks etc all come together to give a to give a final grade so we would certainly be happy to do that and we can anonymize the examples obviously now that we've um we've got lots of examples that we can use okay through through the chair um on our website at the moment is a short five minute video um for general public consumption because i, I believe you know i recognize we're getting into technical detail here and there's maybe students who just want to understand the upper level work um, that is available and we've also supplied a presentation, um, detailed presentation to principals, uh, which had positive feedback of b before the issue of results. We recognize that, um, at the point you, you make, Chair, that examinations and understanding examinations is built up over many, many years. Um, how, how examinations are applied, how they operate, how they work, how examiners work, how appeals work is well understood. And here we were in a short time period radically changing our approach and so understanding is key but as you as you identified there we quickly get into um very technical understanding when we start to dig dig through it so we, we've tried to present information at the high level and and go down to the lower level as people have sought that okay um obviously 
slight differences between A level AS and GCSE um, models. Do you want to speak to that in a bit more detail before I'm able to ask some more questions and bring members in? Yeah, I'll keep it to a high level, um, if that's okay. So um, I guess the AS qualification um, is slightly different in that it uses GCSE mean data rather than the AS, because that was the last qualification that the students uh, completed, if that helps. And then the, um, the GCSE model is different again um, because we don't have um, any individual prior attainment data um, for those GCSE students in the absence of um, data such as key stage three assessments, uh, for example, um, it is based on centre prior performance. Um, and we're, we're in a sort of an, an interesting position, I think, um, in Northern Ireland, and we did explain this and, and we had some interesting questions from principals um, when we uh, presented our webinar um, I think it was earlier this week, I'm losing track of time, um, but we had about 170 colleagues on the, on the webinar. Um, so I guess one option that we could have used for GCSE, uh, because we have a, a, a mostly modular system uh, uh, for GCSEs in Northern Ireland, um, whereby students do take, can take units at different times of their two-year programme, um, we do have some GCSE students who have completed uh, one of their units per, per, per their GCSE, let's say as an example. Um, however, we can't base the model um, on, on those completed units for the whole cohort. So um, we've only got about 68% of the GCSE cohort that have actually completed units, um, and we do have some GCSEs which are linear. Um, so that is unfortunate because in, in some respects we do have a lot of data in the system on uh, a proportion of students, but um, we had to come up with a model um, that would be fair for the whole cohort um, and, um, and, and I think you know, we're in the same position as other jurisdictions in, in that regard. So um, Wales also have a, a modular and linear approach to taking GCSEs. Um, and in England, obviously, it's a linear approach. Um, so we are all following the same approach um, for the GCSE model. Um, but in England, they do have key stage two data available. So, so there is a slight difference there for us okay. with the GCSE model. Members may have some more questions in the details of that, but can, can I ask when the decision was taken to use uh, each model? Yes, so I think um, uh, if, we, if we go back in time, I think it would have been April that we, we drew up all the different um, options uh, that we thought were available. Um, and obviously that was working very as quickly as we could with, with the other jurisdictions and, and sort of keeping in touch also with developments in the South. I think at the time in the South, um, it was thought that exams would still go ahead. Um, so we presented all the options uh, as thoroughly as we could to our council, um, so they were discussed in detail with our, our council, um, and then they were submitted to the department. So I'm, I think pretty sure it was April. Um, in May and June, then, we started testing those models because um, where we had the options of what was available to us in known data, we had no test data. Um, because nobody had gathered prior to this point, for example, the combination of center assess grade and rank order. So we had to test the models against the data sets that we had um, for correlation and return. That again was done across England, Wales and Northern Ireland in shared approaches so we could understand data effects. Um, then beyond that, um, as testing took place, the refinement um, of the model um, happened. The test data we used was previous year's test data, so how good was the model at standardising previous year's known test data and bringing, bringing that forward. SEER is in a strong position in, in, the, in Northern Ireland. We have a lot of data about young people and, and learners in terms of qualification outcomes in Northern Ireland, so we were able to use that. Um, that model was then um, externally tested as well. Um, it was tested in, in two phases, so there wasn't a single test on external. There were, there were two separate tests uh, external, 
and then the application of the model was then inserted into the system um, and the data started to flow from the schools uh, and, and then the data comes out. But I, th I have to say in the exceptional circumstances, you would normally pre-run uh, something like this. You would gather the data. We did not have time to gather data. We had to gather the data in the mouth of what would have been examinations in the mouth of COVID with a business working um, in terms of SEER entirely remotely okay. uh, for the first time. A couple of points. The, the the department have and the minister and the department have said today that the the teacher grade on this occasion was a more robust process. You have said that an enhanced guidance was provided for teacher grading. That bias mitigation guidance was um, was provided. So why was it concluded that rank ordering and school prior performance was necessary, given that the extent of that teacher input to grading? So um, in all the research and evidence, um, teacher judgments have a degree of accuracy. Um, all, all judgments, I suppose, have a degree of accuracy. And that accuracy rises with um, experience. It rises with knowledge of the subject matter. Um, but it is more challenging to criteria reference, i.e. Um, does the student deserve an A or a B, which are quite broad criteria, versus um, the approach taken to rank order. As Margaret says earlier, there is evidence that in terms of rank order, me, if I was a teacher, understanding the pupils in my class and being able to put them in order, knowing which pupil would perform better than another pupil, etc., there's a higher degree of accuracy. But given that nobody had asked in a high-stakes situation Again, come back, absolutely exceptional circumstances in a high-stake situation for CAGs, uh, uh, centre assess grades or rank orders. We did not know to what degree that would raise the accuracy because the high-stakes nature would raise it. Um, and we could only anticipate a degree of inaccuracy with inside that. And that degree of inaccuracy, um, if, if you had just gone with um, teacher assessment grades, and when, when I say inaccuracy, I mean o over optimism. Um, I think is, is perhaps the, the best way to put it. Grades would have likely have risen. Okay. Just, okay. Yeah, go ahead. I was just, I was just going to add. So I, th I think, I think um, it is important to remember perhaps that the A level yeah. model is based on the individual student's AS performance. Um, and it, is, it has been proven to be a very strong predictor of A2 performance. And I think um, it was really reassuring, I think, when we had discussions with um, all the technical colleagues who are managing the process in Wales um, and Northern Ireland, you know, there, there is a agreement of that. And I think um, that also came through our expert peer review. Um, so um, I, do think, I think, do think that was a strong basis um, on which to base on which to base the model okay because it's rank wording this probably has caused the most confusion and prior performance of school has caused the most objection um, did did you run the data for um, a levels on a number of models um, the, the data was tested when we when we were testing what data to insert um, and what data to consider um, it was run a number of times. It was also run by different teams, different statistical teams, so that they were checking whether they were getting the same re result um, in terms of output simultaneously as well. Um, so um, as given, given the time constraints as well, I would say as much testing took place as was possible. Okay. And was there any change to the model further to development, such as the outcome of the, the Scottish grading? The, um, we, we did not change the model. The model was inserted and committed to at that point in the system. Um, to have changed the model at that point um, would have certainly meant we would not have been able to issue results on the 13th of August. Um, and in doing so, we would have um, had issues in terms of meeting that first key principle, which is allowing learners to progress. Okay. And how, how many pupils received uh, a lower SEA grade than their teacher grade? If you bear with me, I've, I've, I've got it for yeah. A-level, yeah. if that's okay. 
Um, so um, uh, it was 11,044 that the grades were optimistic, um, and then over 1,500 um, grades were pessimistic. So those were moved up. Okay, so 11,044 uh, teacher grades were um, reduced for CA grades and 1,500 were increased? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And how do you know how many pupils have been unable to obtain the offers that they had received um, further to those, those changes in grades? Well, if I, if I may, Chair, so I, I personally haven't heard of any students who were not able to get their university place and, and it may just be that because things have been um, happening so rapidly uh, in the last 24 hours I haven't noticed um, anything that's come through our review system um, but, but I think we did hear yesterday from UCAS that it's been an incredibly um, positive year for Northern Ireland students so with a 12% increase in Northern Ireland students being entered into higher education um, and, I, and I have to say, I do think um, that part of that is based on the fact that universities do have confidence in the system that we use this um, summer. You know, it's been really difficult for everyone having to come up with a radically different way of um, issuing grades in the absence of an exam paper. But certainly at the beginning of this process, um, there was a lot of nervousness amongst the HE sector, both in the South um, and across the UK, in terms of the system we would adopt. And we've worked very closely with them and, and through UCAS to reassure them that our model um, would lead to grades that were similar to previous years. That was really important to them. You know, they told us that um, they could uh, accept students onto courses so long as grades were similar. Um, and I think, you know, I've had a number of messages um, in the last 24 hours from universities saying, um, you know, they're really pleased to see uh, Northern Ireland students do so well. And I think that was a core objective of, of what we were asked to do to ensure that the grades issued this year retained public confidence um, and meant that students could progress. And I think, I think um, it, it is important to know that the HE sector um, do have a lot of their own data about the accuracy of predicted grades that they receive every year. Um, there is a report on the UCAS website which shows that um, I think it's over 50% of the predicted grades that are submitted every year for, um, for A-levels are not, are not what the students get in their final um, grades that are awarded. So we've had to work quite closely with the universities to ensure they do understand the process that we've adopted this year can have confidence so that Northern Ireland students weren't in any way disadvantaged in terms of being able to progress uh, onto university. Okay. I think we've certainly heard from a number of pupils that are in um, difficult circumstances and at risk of not accessing, accessing um, further uh, pathways. Listen. Final question for me, I'll let you come in just for the final question for me then is um, you the, the Minister, I presume, has already adjusted your appeals process that previously, despite a consultation response, did not include the ability to appeal and question the grade awarded via the model that it was awarded. That has been changed. Um, are you confident that that appeals process will be able to address what the Minister has today referred to as incorrect results? Um, in, in regards to the appeals process and just in relating to the previous question, in a normal year, and this is not a normal year, in a normal year, students who are un unable to access a university place um, because they are dissatisfied, um, or they haven't achieved the grades and they are dissatisfied and they appeal, um, on that basis would be prioritised. That prioritisation mechanism still exists with inside this new system. Um, and again, we would encourage centres to flag priorities to us so that we can deal with them. Um, and, and issue those. We've also been working flexibly, as, as Margaret said, with the universities in the extended deadline date. Um, in terms of um, the question of uh, the breadth of the appeals process, we have signalled, uh, and I think the Minister made reference to this earlier, there was a student guide. Um, there's a, a student leaflet on the appeals process and how it works and the CA website. 
Um, simultaneously, we have um, updated that that says prior attainment um, will be considered. That includes mock examination data um, for the data from the school in the evidence base at an individual level or where there is a group at a subject level um, submission as well. So that is with inside it. It is not the basis of challenging the model, I think it would be fair to say, uh, Chairperson. Um, it is it is a, a factor of us considering was the grade that was awarded, um, the, the right grade, and does adjustment need to be made? Okay, thank you. Uh, can I bring in members then? Uh, Karen Mullen, MLA, Deputy Chairperson. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, President Margaret. Um, Margaret, if a school uh, has a class of eight pupils and they ca the teacher confidently calculates that all those eight pupils have a strong B, will the modelling shift the lowest ranked pupils to a C grade if the prior school performance shows fewer B grades, even if the Bs are in the upper band in terms of the teacher's calculation? Um, okay, I th I, you, you were just a little bit watery at parts there, but I think I got the question. Um, so again, do you, want, do you want Karen to repeat it briefly? No, yeah, Karen, Karen, if you want to repeat the question briefly, thank you. Yeah, Margaret, if a teacher has a class of eight pupils and confidently calculates uh, all eight as a strong B, will the modelling shift the lowest ranked pupils to a C grade if the prior school performance shows fewer B grades? even if the Bs are in the upper band in terms of the teacher's calculation? So, so again, I think um, for A-level, I, th I think it's important to remember that um, the final grade has been used, um, has been based on, a, on, on the CAG <coughs> order and the individual student's AS performance, so the actual marks they attained on the AS so I think, I think that's perhaps where we've seen a difference in terms of the grade that the teacher might think that the student um, should be attained um, and, and the grade that the AS would suggest that they should um, be awarded based on, um, you know, based on the marks that they received. And I think that's why... Um, so, so the final grade has been based on their actual AS um, performance um, so I think it's, you know, where a, where a teacher really thinks that they can't understand how, how we've got to the final grade that we have, you know, we're really keen to explore that with them through the review process and we will work as quickly as we can um, through any, any areas where they think they can't understand why we have issued a final grade that might be a C um, based on, on AS performance. Um, when they believe very strongly that the student is a, is a B. What about for GCSE? Um, well, for GCSE, it is different. Um, so it's very different for GCSE um, in that we, we don't have a qualification like the AS. Um, so we will be using um, centre performance to help guide us, um, as well as the CAG, as well as the rank order. Um, and we did talk to principals on our webinar about the fact that, you know, we are all in this difficult situation in that many students do have um, a unit one, but those students tend to be a very mixed cohort. So um, some students get entered for units um, early, so before the end of the two years, because they might be very academically able. Um, other schools use that early opportunity to enter students for a unit um, as, a, as a bit of a practice run and, and as a bit of an opportunity um, to have a kind of external validated grade. And then the school works with them to ensure there's quite a lot of improvement. So we couldn't use those um, banked units um, for everyone to say that, um, you know, because you've got a C in unit one, um, you'll get a C in your overall GCSE. That's a very simple example, um, but just to make the point. So... Um, because we've got that variety of students taking units early, um, we are basing the model on, on the way that I just described. But obviously, we will work with teachers as quickly as we can um, where they think they really want us to consider any prior attained units that that student has um, completed um, to, to re-look at the grade issued. Karen? 
Robert, we have a, I have a school here locally, um, uh, and it's AS levels. For the last two years on a subject, they performed, they had 100% pass. This year, 40% pass over the whole, and all the students that they had been awarded a C grade got a U, every single one of them. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, based on... Um also, some of the schools that were vocal yesterday on, on receipt of their results. Um, we have had a look at individual schools, and I think, um, you know, some of the figures that have been shared don't quite match what we have on the system in terms of their SEER qualifications. So I would be really happy to look at any individual school um, where, where we think there is a discrepancy. But I've certainly looked at as many as I could yesterday um, that were said they were unhappy. And in terms of the difference, in terms of what they attained in 2019 versus 2020, um, I think all of them, but you know, I wouldn't want to you know, double check before I would commit to this, have actually increased in terms of the grades attained overall. I think though there is a difference between what they submitted in terms of their CAGs um, and I think they are disappointed on that basis. Um, you know, we, we did work with as many principals as we could in the webinar that we had um, earlier in the week. We wrote to schools the week before, knowing that principals who, who absolutely needed a, a break, a bit of a break over the summer, would start to come back to um, school. So we asked them if they would join us for a webinar to take them through the model um, so that we could explain it to them in as much detail as we could, so they felt prepared for results day. But I do appreciate that things have been happening very quickly um, and that there perhaps hasn't been much time for them um, to, to get you know, an opportunity, particularly if they missed that webinar that we held and haven't had a chance to watch the presentation on the video to understand how we've you know, um, uh, come to those final just, grades. This is a very high performance school, and I'm just giving that example. You can't go from uh, the, the, you know, they have the evidence there the last two years of 100% and go down to 40%. So there's something badly wrong when that has happened. I know we're pushed for time, so I want to just ask Justin. Justin, can you tell us the number of downgrades by school uh, and sector, by school sector? I missed that, that question. If it go, ahead, go ahead again, Karen. Can, can you tell us the number of downgrades by school sector? Um, do you bear with me, Mr. Yeah. Chairman? It's a, a complex question, but I do have the the, the data. I think it might might be some information to that regard at page eighty eight of our PACS members. Um, yeah, it's in the SIA. In the in the. Grammar, and, and I think we go back to the point around um, the terminology of downgrade the grade. It's actually match between the, the centre assessed grade and the actual grade awarded in, in, the, in the component. So it's a, a match component between the centre predicted, the, the centre projected grade and the actual one. In the grammar sector, the match between the centre assessed grade and the actual result grade was 61.3%. And in the secondary, the match between the actual grade and and, and the centre assess was 49%. So that's the, that's the match rate. So it would have been a 51% change up or down. Um, uh, the over optimism um, was in the secondary sector 48.1, and in the grammar sector was 35.1, and the under optimism was in the secondary sector 2.9, and in the grammar sector. Uh, 3.7. But I think that um, in looking at those figures and um, conscious of, uh, of how they might be used, you have to understand around over-optimism across grade distributions. And in the evidence that we've seen, um, both from research um, and other trends, historic trends, there is an increased level of over-optimism in the lower grades. It is, it is more difficult to predict lower grade outcomes, and so standardization might occur in the lower grade distributions. And that being the case, um, not all, and I'm talking about full, full service here, um, the higher grade distributions might be in place in the grammar 
um, and, and a lower distribution through, um, through the secondary, as, as, we, as we classify it. But um, quite happy to share those data across the grades with the committee. Yeah, is it just, I suppose, you know, uh, surely grades from both selective and non-selective schools being put through the same statistical calculation with each other would create inequalities and further disadvantage to those from working class backgrounds. We, I raised it in the committee in the six, and the committee members also have on the 16th of April and the 3rd of June, where we had concerns that there would be further disadvantage through this system for young people from working class areas. And what I, what I am hearing and what I'm hearing back from the schools, that is certainly the case. And we, and one principal yesterday actually said to me, the children who are always disadvantaged are those that this has affected again in the main. Um, and we can't have that. And we want a guarantee from SIA that no young person uh, will be failed throughout this. And one young person failed is one young person too many for us. And I've been listening to the value of the qualification and how important this is. What I want to say to you today is the value of the student is more important. And we want assurances from yourselves that no student will be left behind or disadvantaged. Justin, can I, Karen, just to supplement on the data here, and this is, this is data that we we'll want to get into in more detail, most likely after today when time permits, but Justin, uh, on uh, page 88 of our slide, it's SIA A-level outcomes, 2019 results, 2020 estimates, 2020 results. You have that slide available to you, yeah? I have a version of it. Okay, yeah. so in, in grammar, I presume grammar is the top Yes, the, the top the, data. Yep. The, okay. The grammar so for, is the top data. You can correct me if I'm reading this inaccurately, but so grade C estimate in grammar for 2020 was 97.1 percent. That's right. Yeah. Correct. The SIA award was 91 percent. Yeah. Correct. correct. So a a, a a a reduction on the um on the teacher uh, award in non grammar C. Uh, teacher prediction was 92% and SIA award was 77%. Correct. That's a significant variation. Really? Yeah. Can you, can you explain why that further why that would be the case? The, um, we have seen in the 2019... I'm sorry to cut across you, but I suppose why I pick C as well is obviously that's a key grade in terms of pass. Uh, in yeah. A level, the C isn't. Or sorry, A level, of course. In, in A level, the C isn't but seen as. I presume a, this will extra, could potentially extrapolate to GCSE, though. Yeah. Um, Let you answer. In, in, in terms, you, you have to look at the 2019 data and then the estimates. So if you look at the estimates of the C, it's uh, the estimate against the, the projected estimate is plus six percentage points in the grammar sector at that boundary to 97.1. Mm-hmm. The estimate in the secondary sector is plus 16.9. So there is an increased amount of overestimation against the 2019 examination-based outcomes. So that's the examination-based results in that as a comparator. So in terms of standardization, and standardization, as I said before, in, in lower grades takes effects. In terms of standardization, then the standardization makes adjustment for overconfidence in the system, so that's why you have the adjustment out. But I think what you do see is then the actual increased results for that sector at that grey boundary, this is the secondary sector, are plus 1.9, as opposed to the, the grammar sector is actually minus 0.1. Mm. So the outcomes, the student grades received by the secondary sector increased at that grade, as opposed to remained relatively consistent with yeah. the standard over previous years. Yeah, saying, yeah bring in row. So there's a slightly higher percentage increase in non-grammar compared to grammar, but yes. there is a significantly greater standardization in the non-grammar of the teacher prediction. There's a, there's a, there's a greater degree of standardization, but there was a higher amount of over confidence okay i know you've given some response to why you think that's the case but ca can you ca can you answer that again why i think why I think, um the process regards um that as um a, 
a, a percentage that's in need of, of standardisation. I think that we, we are off into the realms of what the research tells us, and it tells us that there's a lot of complex reasons. I would be concerned that um, out of this we would draw conclusions that teachers in one sector are less accurate than teachers in another sector overall. Um, I, I don't think that that should be the assumption we make here. I think that um, uh, the evidence I'm would... certainly not saying that for no, I'm, just any pointing, yep. I'm just pointing yep. that out. But yep. I, I think that overall, um, we do know that accuracy, um, not accuracy, overconfidence tends to emerge in the, in the lower grades, in the lower grade distribution overall as you get into the lower grades. Um, and, and with that basis, there may be an, an increased amount of overconfidence. And I do come back to the point of the, the difficulty in um, having criterion reference grading and it does become more of a challenge um, in the lower grade distribution and therefore more standardisation applies at that particular point. Okay, I, I can't just say I need to bring more people in. Karen, do you want a brief supplementary or content for me to move on? Thank you. Thanks, Sorry, Robbie, you want a brief supplementary? Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah, just in that. Um, um, we've heard actually from the Minister and I think from yourself, Margaret, uh, the value of the AS results and how robust they are. So, with regard to the estimates that are just on what the Chair picked out, the Cs, would that not include the value of the AS results in the teachers' estimates, given that the teachers' estimates will have had to have come with evidence, robust evidence as, as to that? And then, in that instance, as the chair has rightly picked out, why is it so prevalent in C? In, 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 and, and most of these secondary schools, if not all of them, will be increasingly performed better year on year. And I'm not sure what the percentage is year on year, by the way, in terms of if this year mirrors the percentage improvements that they're making, but, but take significantly. In so can I get this bottomed out once and for all in terms of those teachers' estimates? The AS grade, how much value mm. was given to that? Across the board, not just in C, how much value was given to the AS with regard to the teachers' estimates in terms of positioning their, their pupils, their students? It's, it's challenging to make that judgment from the teacher grade point of view, and the reason being is that we set out guidance for the schools, but we didn't set out a standard process. We said that this was the range of evidence, mocks, homework, um, engagement with the pupils, etc. And we may have said prior, well, we, we did say prior attainment, which we would have considered with inside the AS. So it's then, it was then, and it was a very compressed timescale. So it's down to the um, schools at that point to decide through that process how much bearing they played on that weight. But um, one of the interesting figures um, I was able to gather was that if you compare A-level outcomes um, and you look at where those A-level students had an AS grade, the, the centre assessed grades were 41% uh, of them were higher than the AS grade that that young person actually achieved, and in some cases more than one grade higher. Um, so you, it, for us, is that you then get into questions, and really we need to explore this with, with schools, is that schools um, trying to project forward value, you know, that, that they, they, they believe that the young person would have accelerated by two grades, is that other factors that they, um, they, they wish to take into consideration, but it would seem, um, given that there is a strong correlation between AS performance and an A-level performance, it would seem that um, multiple grades overestimated would, would be challenging. However, that's not to be said that through the appeals process we can't explore that. And just, just on that, just find that this is more of a statement just to you agree. I think that the Minister and, and you would be agreed that the AS grades are a pretty robust um, measurement. So therefore, in, on appeal, it would be reasonably expected that an, anyone who had their grade lowered, lower than their AS, is likely to achieve that grade on appeal. Now, obviously, I mean that's where I think we need to, we need to get to. I don't think we need an appeal system for that because CCA have that data now. And, that, and, I, and the ministers here and I did. I, I said, let's let's scrub the appeals and let's let's go to the data we have because we're data rich, as you've said. Yes, yes. I think that in answer to that question, the AS is is a component. I think in an appeals process would expect the school to submit, to, to refer back. We have that data. We're able to share that with school to save time. Um, it is a factor that's in, in the broad consideration that we would have, and you're quite right, it, is, it needs to be part of that appeals. But I think it needs to come back to some holistic judgments. There may be, as there is in every other year, and, and go back to normal years, there may be cases 
where students have particular circumstances um, that the school try to represent through the projected grade. We need to understand that as, as well, but certainly, yes, the AS is a, is a good indicator. Okay, Daniel, did you want to ask a brief supplementary in relation to this? Because uh, I want to bring Robin in and uh, come back to you after that. But if it's, a, if it's in relation to this, go ahead. I'm happy to go. Okay, at, at Robin, full, you, full MLA, and then I'll bring you right in. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Chairman. I have to say that the last point that uh, has been made, I think, gives me a, a huge degree of comfort in, in terms of the appeals uh, process, <clears throat> and particularly the use of the AS that data. But can I just ask you, um, uh, two short questions, I think. Um, first of all, in terms of GCE, is there a greater emphasis placed on um, the, the evidence uh, on the opinion and the professionalism of the teacher in the award? Am I right in that? Um, so for the A-level, um, you know, obviously the, the CAGs that were submitted and the rank order information has been incredibly helpful. Um, but also, as, as um, I think I've, I've explained, the AS, their, the individual student's actual AS performance. Uh, sorry, is a, I'm talking about the GCSEs. Oh, GCSE, uh, sorry. Is, is there a greater emphasis played on oh, Justin's not I, I'm on agreeing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at GCSE, there will be a greater emphasis played on, the, on the, the teacher information because of the limited amount of prior performance data. Okay, that, that's fine. Uh, could I just ask you then, uh, Justin or Margaret, if you would? Uh, help me with the appeals system itself, if you can talk me through that, and particularly around the AS and the knowledge that a teacher might have to submit evidence, uh, and it's the school who will make the appeal as opposed to the pupil who will make the appeal. If, if, I, if I can start out then from the head of the process, and I'll hand over to Margaret, who will talk you through the stages, but... Um, in, in discussing, and we did consult actually on the appeals process, we, we, we put that out and received a lot of feedback um, in, in regards it. Um, in putting that together, in a normal year, a student would approach their school or college to submit an appeal. Um, and we felt that it was important to retain that aspect because schools and colleges understand and are able to liaise with SEA and therefore can reduce the, reduce the burden on the whole system in explaining how to take it through. We do recognise that some students um, may wish to complain, and, and so there are complaints processes in, in order to do that in terms of the sender. But once they go to the, the sender, then the sender has that information ready to make the appeal through the appeals process, and there's an initial review. And I'll hand over to Margaret, who will explain the, the initial review process. Um, yes, yeah, so I think, um, I think we've seen that, you know, in other parts of, of the UK, um, you know, perhaps some teachers don't feel that the appeals process is as clear. I mean, we have had to change everything this summer in a very short period of time. Um, but I really do hope that here in Northern Ireland, um, we've, we've provided um, as many tools as we can to make the appeals process um, as open and easy to use for schools. So, you know, it is, it is very different this year, isn't it, in that we don't have an exam script and a standard of, of marks um, that in a normal year we would be defending um, and sort of going through that process. So this year um, it really is a very different process. So we've provided an app um, which is very similar to the app that um, all teachers use to submit the calculated um, grades and the rank order information so schools can quickly indicate the class or the individual students that they would like a review to take place um, for. Um, we've asked them to indicate um, if it's uh, they're issuing the review because they think we've used the wrong data. Um, and I think some of the points that, that Karen made in terms of, um, you know, instances where schools might want us to think about other information that they have on students, you know, that will be facilitated through that process. Um, and then I think the other key thing we've tried to do this year is to ensure that we're, we're as clear as we can be with principals, that we really don't want this to be a long, arduous task for them. Um, the examples of information that would be helpful for us to make um, decisions um, as quickly as possible to support their students. Um, and we've also issued, and, and maybe just uncovered this, a, a, a new guide for students to explain the process. So if they feel um, they're not happy with the grade that they received, um, they can see the steps laid out in, 
in one side of A4 to help them also understand what we're doing this year. Does that help? Can I just add, Chair, just a question. In terms of time scale, could you just perhaps say a few words around what you envisage the time scale for these decisions to be made within? I think that um, it, it, each case will have a different detail of information, so there will be some cases where we can make rapid decisions, um, and there are some cases that will be more complex and will take time. I think that the point made by uh, a, an earlier member around uh, university access, obviously we have priorities to ensure that those who are awaiting places or seeking places get a, an earlier consideration in that, um, and then we will work through models beyond that. Um, I, I, I know that as you go through the phases, sometimes it gets more complex and more evidence, and, and in previous years, you, you do end up with one or two out of the 25,000 cases that go uh, a, a long distance, um, but I've never seen one of those cases which has affected a, a young person in terms of the university access, and I would be you know, committed to, we, we need to continue that drive to get that cleared by the, the closeout date with UCAS. Just to add, I suppose, to, to Justin's points there, so uh, we are absolutely committed to working through reviews as quickly as possible. I think we are um, one of a very small number of AOs that do every year have an A-level priority service, um, and this year UCAS has agreed to extend the deadline for um, A-level qualifications to be um, reviewed, But and that's to the 7th of September, but um, I, you know, you know, again, there is an option for schools to indicate if, if anybody is high priority, but I really do hope that based on um, the, the UCAS figures that we received um, yesterday with the 12% increase of Northern Ireland students being accepted into higher education, um, I really hope that if we have got um, reviews that need to be processed quickly, we can manage those um, you know, very efficiently. Sure, I would just make a small point that uh, much is made about universities, and that's where the fault will go. But there are other professional bodies that are awaiting uh, results as well for young people who have decided not university isn't the route for them, but other professions that are. Uh, and, and those bodies also need to uh, be made aware of the process and the time scale within which you're going to be working. Yep. Can I supplement that question? What if what if the school um, declines to submit an appeal for a pupil? If a school, um, and, and we refer to the head of centre, which is normally the principal, decides, decides that they do not wish to submit an appeal, the young person would have the right to complain. Um, initially, they would complain to the school, and the school would have a complaints procedure. That complaints procedure would then work through, um, usually a school has a, a complaints body that looks at the complaint. If the complaints body decides the appeal must go ahead, then we would expect the school to submit that at that point. If it does not, the young person then would have the right to contact SEER, um, having exhausted the school complaints process, and we will look at the evidence. Um, we can then ask for an appeal to be submitted um, if we believe that that complaint should be upheld, um, and then we will receive the, the complaint that way. If uh, SEER decides that the complaint should not be upheld, then it would probably progress to Ombudsman. Yeah. Well, at that point. The slight procedural challenge there that normally the complaints body of a school is the Board of Governors, which doesn't always meet as regularly as might be necessary for this type of a process, but that's maybe something that can be considered. Again, again through the Chair, um, if, if uh, time of processing is an issue at the pupil level, that's why I, I gave the helpline at the earlier sure. part today. We, we would want, okay. want to know that. Before I bring Daniel, can I just want ask one other brief question in terms of the modelling? Is, is pupil date of birth used in the standardisation modelling? No. No? Okay. Uh, Daniel McCrossan. Th thank, thank you, you, Chair. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, uh, Justin, for being here to take our questions and hear our serious concerns about this entire process, how it was handled or mishandled, as uh, many of us have argued, uh, and the outcome that has affected so many children across the entirety of Northern Ireland. Justin, I have to say, as the Chief Executive of, of uh, SIA, I am hugely disappointed with how you uh, and the Minister have handled this entire process. From the earliest stages, we as committee members and as individual MLAs uh, representing our own parties and our own respective constituencies raised significant concerns with you in relation to 
all of the various revelations that have come to light in the last 24 hours. Throughout the process and all of the questions, some very detailed that were submitted to you and ha had with you not only just in committee but also via Zoom uh, and directly with the Minister as well in the Assembly. Uh, we were told continually that this is a working progress. Uh, we'll get back to you. We'll get back to you. Throughout this entire process, there has been no answers to any of the serious concerns and questions that I, as a, an elected member for West Tyrone and as a spokesperson for the SDLP, have raised with you in relation to how this model could potentially impact on our children. And it raises further questions. It raises questions about who else has raised concerns with you, because I am reading a report. Uh, that was sent to you, there was correspondence sent to you on the 21st of May from uh, Dr Hugh Morrison, uh, outlining a series of uh, concerns that he had and serious questions. You did respond to those questions, albeit very, very limitedly, uh, in, in one line, in fact, to answer each of the serious questions he raised on the 26th of May. But then he followed and sent a further uh, piece of correspondence to you on the 23rd of the 6th that was two and a half pages long and had some very serious concerns that I would largely argue have predicted the situation that we are in today. And I have to say regrettably that he has said that you have not responded to the serious concerns that he has raised that are legitimate questions of the process that you have used, even though people like Dr. Uh, Hugh Morrison and I and other academics and teachers and politicians have raised. You have refused to listen. You dug your heels in and were willing to die in the ditch for a model that was untried and untested, and a model that re realistically, regardless of how you dress this up today, has let down 11,000 children across Northern Ireland, has deeply insulted the comments in particular of late in the last 24 hours, uh, have deeply insulted schools, have undermined the judgment of teachers have annoyed parents because they're worried about their children. I've made these points to the Minister today very bluntly, and I'm making them to you. And if we're talking about assessments, if I was to assess your handling of this, Justin, as the Chief Executive, I'd be giving you a you. Because, to be very blunt about it, I am very, very, very unhappy with your handling of this. And I would argue further that your handling and the handling by the Minister of this entire process is going to be open to significant legal challenge. And I can confirm that because I've had conversations with solicitors in the last few hours as well. The sad reality about all this, when we're talking about statistics and anomalies, Justin, is that in, in the middle of all this, there's young people who were looking for their opportunity, looking for their break, looking to get to universities in England, other parts of the UK, and other parts of various countries uh, as well. Th that will be affected as a result of this, because they're not going to hang on, no matter how cosy or good the relationship is, for an appeals process to work its way through. That's not going to happen. And I think you largely accept that, regardless of how this is dressed up. The reality is, and as blunt as I can make it, SIA failed and have failed the young people, 11,000 of them, and have failed schools and have failed teachers. This model didn't work. And I'll read a section. Those, and this is put to you, and you didn't respond to it, from Dr. Hugh Gallagher at Queen's University of Belfast on the 23rd of the 6th, 2020. Does a statistical technique or algorithm or mathematical model exist which can defensively adjust the predicted grades to bring them into line with the 20% to 24% range of the past? Can one compute a defensible, comp defensible compromise position somewhere between 20% and 67%? The answer is, and I quote an emphatic, no, this is a man who has years of experience in this, who give you a very strong alert and you ignore him. There, and he goes on. There can be no doubt that the claims of Ofqual and SIA that centre-based statistical techniques or algorithms or mathematical modelling can be used to moderate predicted grades are without foundation. It's there in black and white, sent to you on the 23rd of the 6th, 2020. Can you tell me, given the seriousness of what I've read in here, and given that it has confirmed largely what we are seeing today and yesterday, why this was not responded to, why it was ignored? Why there wasn't even an acknowledgement or a seat sent to a man that has reached out to express serious concern about the formula you used? Was this shared with the minister? And if it was, what did the minister do when you shared the information with him? I need you to answer that, Justin, because it's very serious. Thank you very much. Um, 
In terms of, and I, I recognise um, Dr. Morrison's uh, submission, um, we had submissions from um, external factors. Um, we had um, commissioned internal, um, external. We had shared with the Joint Council for Qualifications. Um, we had worked across regulators. We had worked with experts, including people from Oxford and Cambridge University, in developing this. I've always cited that the, the best solution was examinations, and it was not available to us. And if it was not available to us, then this alternative um, approach was the next best operation. We presented all the options to SEER Council. SEER Council presented those options, considering the challenge, not just from one academic, but many academics um, in this matter, including globally leading were they academics ignored? in this matter. No, they were part of the process. They were part why, of, why was this one ignored? They were part of supporting. They were, th that was not ignored. It was why wasn't that responded to? Daniel, let, let, let Justin respond. This is a respond. serious question. I, I understand that, but make sure... There's legitimate I, concern I can't, here. I can't comment on who or when um, one individual was responded to in this entire process, but I can say that if there was information presented to it, we consider it. We consider it with many academics. This was not a judgment of one person. This was a judgment of many people who have professional understanding in this space in order to find the best solution in the time available. And I would point out again, exceptional circumstances in which, and, and uh, through the chair, um, my organisation has worked with outbreak since the 20th of March. I have worked with the education system. I have worked across both school leaders, teaching unions, with the Children's Commissioner. We have worked with the Children's Youth Panel to understand their concerns. We have had to address not just the academic considerations, but the societal considerations of getting young people their grades. And people have worked inordinate hours in my organisation to deliver a solution working with externals and expert externals who also could write academic papers. This was not um, a time for detailed um, exploration of every factor of every academic. We had to have a solution. We had to have a solution that would deliver results to learners that was robust. So we took views from a variety of sources. Dr. Hugh Morrison was not invited, and I, I, I think it's unfair to comment on one academic. I have respect for all academics. But Dr. Hugh Morrison was not asked for comment, but his comment was considered. And the presentation to the council was presented to the minister. To go to your point about an algorithm, once the approach had been considered, once the approach had been decided, it was for us to then implement that piece of work. And I believe that the minister committed to an early presentation chair to bring that algorithm across to MLAs if they, they wish to see it. So, you know, we, we will share the data in terms of that being transparent. But I come back to the key principle. You had to consider a range of views, including academic input, to get to a point where you could issue grades. Now, if there was a viable alternative if there was a viable alternative into this situation, then let it be brought forward. I will consider it, post this. But that viable alternative to meet the key principles that were set for me to issue grades and to maintain standards across year, those principles were set for my organisation to deliver, and that's what we set about doing. I, I can understand some of the arguments you make, but I dispute quite a few of them. Like, Dr. Morrison, and I'm sure many others, as did I, asked for the formula at an earlier stage to which we were told continually that it wasn't completed yet, it wasn't tested. Uh, and even at this stage, even on the Nolan show, which you were on the other morning and gave your time to answer some of the questions that he put to you, you still didn't answer the question. I want to see the algorithm, I want to see the formula, and people such as like, like academics like Hugh Morrison and many others can then, as I told the Minister, check your homework, Justin, because there are huge questions about the calculations that you have used to determine grades that then trumped the judgments of teachers who were with these students and supported them, not only throughout this very difficult pandemic, but prior to it, and are best placed to understand the quality of the work and appreciate the quality of work of those students. This is not an acceptable situation where, I, and I'm very concerned actually because if there's many others, I want to hear from them as well as to who flagged similar concerns to Dr. Morrison uh, as I'm flagging with you today. And I've asked you, did the minister see this? Has the minister been aware of this? No, the minister was not aware because that letter was sent to the 
CEO Chief Executive, I operated under the direction of what I was what I had to provide, which was qualification outcomes by the 13th of August, which was standardised to previous years. If, if Dr Morrison wrote to other people, so be it, I can't answer on behalf of Dr Morrison. Dr. Morrison. And I, I, would, I would come back to the point that you have to consider the multiple views of many academics. Mm. And this was an entirely unique situation with a unique process. I suspect that there will be debate for years about you know, the um, algorithms, et cetera. But what you do is you take the best views you possibly can and you implement them so you get to the point of issue and grace. The alternative was to not standardize. And that would have breached the provision that was given to me, which was consistency, similarity with previous years. Justin, this algorithm is so unique that no one knows how it has formulated the outcomes that it has. No one has seen it. You haven't discussed it with anybody. Any questions that I have asked you prior to this week, you haven't given me answers to at all. Neither is the minister, for that matter, firmly on the record. And, and I want to know bluntly now, whenever this is produced, and people do check it, because I have no doubt, given what I'm reading here and other things, that there's going to be very serious concerns, and it will add to the legal challenge that is undoubtedly going to come to the processes that have inflicted so much hurt on quite a lot of people, particularly disadvantaged children across Northern Ireland, because I've heard the figures from various other members uh, in relation to the percentage downgrades of each and every school across Northern Ireland. It's quite a number of them. Quite a number of them. I'm sure you've acknowledged that. Do you think, Justin, sitting here as the chief executive of this organisation, after you were warned of the serious risks that were going to be posed to children and, and young people, particularly with these results in schools. Do you think you got this right? I believe that the solution that we have implemented was the best possible solution available that would meet the directions and the requirements of issuing grades and maintaining standards and the value of the qualification over time. Excuse me. And I believe that SEER couldn't have done any more. Working across awarding bodies, working across regulators, working across jurisdictions, working um, with all experts in this field, I believe that the solution that we provided was the best possible solution available in the unprecedented and extreme circumstances that we faced. Justin, you, you remember I made a proposal to you a number of months ago when I expressed my concern about the model and the line in which you were going. Uh, and I asked you to use evidence in the schools before the grades were finalised, uh, not as part of the appeal. So what, what I'm basically saying to you is we, we put a proposal there that was going to be evidence-based to substantiate and confirm the predicted grade that was uh, given by teachers. And that was refused to use a model that was untried and untested and has flown completely in the face of the judgment of the teachers who have worked hard, professionals out there who have worked tirelessly to support our young people. And Justin, I'm going to say this to you as the chief executive of this organization, of, of SIA. You need to look at that camera, Justin, because they're watching today, and you need to apologize to teachers for the remarks that have been made in the last 24 hours because they feel that they are undervalued, that their judgment doesn't matter because of comments made by SIA. And secondly, you need to apologise as well, Justin, to the 11,000 young people who will not accept any of the excuses or dressing up of the reality that this is a total mess and it has failed, and you know it failed. And I want to know, Justin, are you acting under the political instruction of the minister? You realise this is wrong? You realise it went wrong, you realise it needs to be fixed, but you can't say anything about it because the minister, as he has already said, you're doing as you are instructed. And that raises very serious concerns indeed, because regardless of who's given the instructions, 11,000 young people, teachers, parents, people are very concerned about this reality. And I can tell you, Justin, we're not letting it go. I want to see the algorithm, I want to see the formulas, and I also want to reassure you, Justin, that this committee, and, and, and indeed the Assembly, should be shining a very bright torch on SIA in terms of their internal processes, because everything seems to be done under a veil of secrecy without any accountability or regulation of the processes that have made a determination that is going to impact on the lives of young people forever. Pandemic or no pandemic, that's the reality run. And just to finish on this, Chair, and thank you for your indulgence, to be very clear, I have no confidence, I never had, in the model which is rolled out. I have no confidence that an appeal process will fix it. It will make this very, very difficult and add to the suffering and pain and hurt 
of so many people. I'm, I'm so angry today, Justin, because I spoke with you and I expressed concern. And if you were going down the lane you were going down, you should have had the decency to come back to us and let us know that this was the model that was going to be used and explain it to us. Because yesterday I was in a situation where parents were crying on the phone and young people crying because they, they fell short by two or three grades. And I couldn't explain to them how this happened. Because, Justin, whether you agree or not today, you did tell me that the previous performance of schools would also be taken into consideration, and so did the Minister. You told me that on a Zoom call with David Canning. So what has changed? But in the case of previous performance in centre, and when we're talking about a generic model, it is taken into account, as has been outlined to you today, at both AS level, and AS level ultimately contributes towards A2, although there are different arrangements on that, and GCSE. That information is there. So when we're talking about generic, three generic models, um, and we're referring to them, we were referring to that prior centre assessment data would feature as part of two of them. Just, just a final point, Chairman. Yeah, you make this. Be final, Daniel, no, At the centre of all this, and I've, I've reiterated this, and I've said it to you as well directly, Justin, we are not talking about statistics. We are talking about young people and children and their lives. Why, given the process SIA went through, did SIA feel it appropriate to release the grades that they knew, as they've described, were anomalies at 10 past seven to principals on the day they received it? Where is the duty of care to the young people that had to receive those results the following morning? To open an envelope, and I, some will remember this, but I remember getting my A-level results, and I was a nervous wreck for days. To open up an envelope and see that you might have been predicted a certain grade and end up with a U. A U. Is that acceptable, Justin? Seriously, is that acceptable for a young person whose heart has been hung on an opportunity to go to university Maybe here in Northern Ireland, maybe across the island of Ireland, maybe in the UK or further afield. Is it appropriate that you awarded them a U and now they're going to be, they've been described as anomalies and they're going to be subject to go through a rigorous appeal process? Is that acceptable? You need to admit here and now that this system has failed and it has failed the young people right across Northern Ireland. It wasn't fit for purpose to begin with and you went for it because you felt you'd no other option. That's all I'm hearing today because I'm not hearing you say this was perfect. I'm not hearing you say you've got confidence in today. I did before, not today. I think, Justin, that you have the same view as most around this table and watching and feel that this has let a lot of people down and it didn't work. And what you need to do and what you should do on behalf of CA is advise the minister that this was a mistake and he needs to move to rectify it because we're talking about people's lives and they're okay. depending on us. Let me bring Robert Butler, MLA, in at that stage. Just, Chair, before you did, did you want to respond to any of that? I, 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 think, I think there, there is one point in there where we need to provide uh, clarity. Um, in terms of the anomalies, we had identified um, a, a small number of cases where, um, as was outlined, there were cases where a, a U was awarded. Um, we could not, in uh, prior to the issue of results, we could not... Um, interface with the schools because we believed that the data provided had had issues but we knew that at appeal that the data could be provided to us and whilst I accept that um, we had to go to the point of issue results we immediately made proactive contact with those schools uh, to get uh, resolution um, in terms of the appeals process um, I have confidence in the appeals process it is broad in terms of the data that we can provide it is rapid it will prioritize needs I have confidence that this was the best solution that could be provided in the time given to meet the key objectives that were set. It wasn't just a matter um, for the Minister. It was considered by Council, which is an independent body, um, and it was considered by Council in terms of the options available. The options presented to us uh, by Mr McCrossan, whilst we did take them and that we had factors of those in our consideration, there was insufficient time to review and moderate 25,000 student portfolios. It would not have been achievable within the time frame that was available. And whilst I, I recognise and welcome the effort of Mr. McCrossan 
to meet with us and give ideas, and they were very welcome indeed, and we did think about them and we did consider them. At that point in time, there was insufficient time to make correction if we were going to pursue that. I also think that standardisation still would have had to apply for me to meet the objectives, unless the objectives were to change. Okay. Thank you. Robbie. Thank you, uh, Margaret and Justin. Thank you for coming. What I will say uh, at this point is, Justin, to be fair to you, you have made yourself open and available throughout this week uh, for multiple interviews under extreme pressure. Um, and for that, I thank you. However, um, given the interviews that I've listened to, I haven't become any more, it hasn't become any more clear to me, to be honest, um, as to how we are where we are. Um, given some of the statistics that have been, that have been shared, so some of the, the better statistics, if you like, which the Minister would give at the start and, and, and the market would give at the start is the increases and the, the, the improvements. What I can't get my head around and what I can't square, and I shared this with the Minister, is that in multiple phone calls yesterday with um, principals of schools, of some excellent schools in, in Lagan Valley, there wasn't one of them that didn't have huge frustrations. Now, there was a variance in, the, in the, the, the level of appeals that they are prepared to make, but every school will be making appeals based on the, the information that they have submitted. Now, as, as, as Daniel has alluded to, he's, he's, he's uh, quantifying the number of disaffected students that have been in around 11,000. Now, our students are very clever. They, they will know that there is, every year there are grades that go up and down, and sometimes you don't get what you want. Everybody knows that. My, my real concern here is time. Time. So, um, have you got any idea of the quantity of appeals that CCA are going to be getting? First of all, for A level. Secondly, AS. We haven't looked at GCSE yet. You guys have obviously got a, a, a complement of staff, a complement of ability, and an upper level of what you can achieve. Now, given what has happened in Scotland, which I wouldn't fully agree with what happened in Scotland, I would agree with what has happened in Wales, mind you. Uh, with regard to their attitude to maybe circumventing an appeals process and relying on the data and data that you guys already possess. So, what, what, what I'm, so uh, have you estimated? Are you estimating? Because I, I'll give you an estimate of what I think the appeal is going to look like based on, uh, on the projections of appeals that I've asked the teachers in my area. Uh, the appeals on a normal year and their appeals this year would be somewhere in the region of five times the level of appeals. So does CCAI have the capacity to do that? And the time scales are, are, are incredibly tight. Sure. I'll give you one example, which isn't the university. It's a paid, it's a paid uh, degree with a high profit organisation. They need an answer within, I think it's eight days, Chair, because I think you know of this case. Yep. It's an eight day turnaround from today. So uh, that's one. Now there will be many like that. And then obviously yeah, we have our universities and you guys have indicated something about the seven. So, I mean, capacity could be a, a huge issue, and that's why I think we would favour a, yeah. a more and, robust and, move. Uh, if, if I may, I mean, if there is a if there is a case and it needs to be flagged to us as key priority, even beyond the seventh, you know, we will do all we can to understand cases like that um, through the school. So I would encourage, again, if you know the school, um, make it make it aware to us so that we can work through it as quickly as possible. Um, it is very difficult to anticipate. Um, as you say, it's difficult to anticipate. I spoke to three uh, school principals this morning, and they are indicating similar levels of appeal, but they are more satisfied schools. I, I accept that. Um, and that was three, and, and different sectors those, those schools were from as well. But um, as of last night, we'd only had 100 appeal, appeals. At the same time last year, we had 208. But I don't think that that's a fair representative indicator because. Um, it's a different process where we are batching together. The batching will increase the, the speed of the process. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, the ability, the, the, the scope of the appeal is different to the, the previous appeal. There's no doubt that um, if it rises uh, to a considerable level, there's the challenge of resource. here is not the biggest of the awarding organisations. Um, we will commit. Um, additional and extra resource to the to the project if if we need to um, to get this frankly over the line uh, for these these young people uh, in those corrections. But it's very it's very difficult right today to estimate I exactly that level of demand and and the pressure it will put on it. But I, I, I give the assurance I, I will put additional resource as as required into it. However, some of the resource that's needed on some of the cases. 
um, is, is high technical resource. So what we're trying to do is also prioritize where the centers have particular concerns and, and, and using data to, to analyze and prioritize that. Um, two questions, Chair. I'll, I'll put them both in, and the, rather yeah. than to go on, put them in separate. So the, 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 the first one is based on what we know now, um, uh, and I accept. I think you, you can't predict the GCSE uh, fallout because the results are relative, would be unknown. Is that we, we don't know the results at this point in time. Okay. Given what we know now uh, with regard to this, would you be anticipating a similar uh, kickback? Given that there's, it's a slightly different process, but now we know how this one sort of has panned out and the anomalies that it, would you be expecting, and I, I'm not trying to make people nervous prior, but I'm sure you guys have stratified your risk assessment here, do you, do you anticipate um, a similar uh, fallout, if you like, from the GCSEs? It, it's difficult to judge. In, in, a, in, a, in a normal year, um, it would, by the time we've worked through all the processes and comparisons across jurisdictions and everything, it would be about four or five days before before we actually know the data. Um, I think that the some of the concerns and represented here today are about uncertainty of a very new process. Um, hopefully, actually through the A level process, we've explained some of that uncertainty, and we will continue and, and you know taking from today the point made. Um, we, we need to continue to explain the process uh, and, and share the process. But once we do that, uh, maybe that will alleviate that. But I do think that given it is standardisation and there is this issue of standardisation to protect the value of the qualifications and whether, and, and, and I note Scotland's decision, but Scotland's decision was a political decision. Um, given that decision that has been taken in, into Scotland, there may be you know, there may be concern with the, the GCSE process. I'm also reflective that the GCSE process has a limited amount of data mm -hmm. associated. Prior data is not available at Key Stage 3, um, for example. Um, but we will do everything we can to reduce any error or any issue and, and avoid a quantum of appeals in that process. I thank you. And just very, very quickly, um, I asked an obscure question of the, of the Minister, um, and it, it included rams and, and, and cows, and it was written a little bit in round format. But I, I just want to ask, is this a bespoke individual model that's been totally created, or has this been taken from another field, so to speak? Um, I had a phone call last night, again, from a farmer who said this looks very much like uh, how we um, how we score animals for breeding and grade them, so that, uh, and, and they talked it through and it sounded actually very plausible. So is this a bespoke model that's been created specifically for this, or is it, has it been taken off the shelf uh, somewhere else? With I, I, think, I think statistics um, have commonality wherever they're used. Um, obviously, it's a particular avenue of a particular branch of statistics, so you will find similarity. Um, Interestingly, through the process, we've brought in statisticians from different agencies and bodies to help us and, and assist us uh, as well, and, and they find similarity with, with some of the component parts and then have to learn some of the other parts within inside that. Well. There's a bespoke model. It, it, it is. A bespoke, I mean, this, this, has, this is unique. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robbie. Catherine Kelly. That's it now. Um, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Justin and Margaret. Um, just to supplement what Kjorn mentioned, what assurances can you give us that young people from working class backgrounds have not uh, been further disadvantaged through this process? Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll start off, and, and uh, Margaret may want to add uh, further factors. I think that the indicators I gave earlier was that we, we, we don't have data for SFME or, or, or social quintiles. Um, CIA doesn't hold that, and we haven't mapped that, that data. But in terms of the data we do have, we do know um, uh, grammar versus uh, non-selective data. And as I'd indicated earlier, there's been um, rises uh, in the non-selective sector. And, and as you saw from the data earlier, there's been rises in outcomes at particular grade boundaries, which are actually in the non-selective, in some component parts, higher than, than the selective sector. So in terms of outcome, there seems to be a more positive position. But I think that further work will also have to be done over time. 
in looking at uh, data sets um, and, and how outcomes are distributed and, and depending on how you match it to other data sets. We, we at this moment in time, are concentrating on awarding. Um, and, and so that's the indicator that we have to present to this committee. I don't know if Margaret has anything to say. Um, yeah, I think just, just to add a, a couple of things, perhaps. So, um, you know, throughout this process, we've been very keen to ensure that, you know, from an, an equalities perspective, everything is as fair as possible. And I think our initial... Um, you know, tests, um, you know, show that, 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 you know, the process is fair. I, I do think, um, you know, one of the key issues I've had fed back to me from principals who, um, who might tend to teach students who have high levels of um, disadvantage um, is that perhaps, you know, whilst we... I think there is some confusion about the model that, that, we've, that we've used, and I think... Um, uh, you know, even events like today, I hope, and anything else we can do in terms of those examples I said we would produce to show how the model has worked, um, I'm, I'm sure will help uh, principals. But if they have um, individual learners who they really do think, um, you know, that in a way we've used the wrong data because they might have other data to, to evidence um, that they've got a student... Um, who they do think um, should get a higher grade. You know, that's why we've impl implemented the review system this year and tried to make it quicker and easier to use than ever before. So, you know, we're really keen to work with principals if they think there is an issue. I think I just want to go back to a point, I think, to maybe make clear something I said. So when I said 11,000, I, I meant grades, so that isn't students. So... Um, I think that's important. And I have to say, again, going back to that UCAS data, um, UCAS has said that this year, more than ever before, um, students from um, disadvantaged backgrounds have entered higher, higher education, and that is also reflective of, of students from Northern Ireland. So if there are any students who have not had a place um, at university this year, you know, we are totally committed to, to working through those... Um, instances but I have to say I haven't had any flag but, but it might be because I haven't been in working today to look at the priority cases that have come through and obviously colleagues today have flagged um, there is a high priority case in terms of an employment maybe it's a apprenticeship degree apprenticeship opportunity I'm not sure. Could I also add chair just uh, at the commencement of this process we actually did um, uh, an equality review of the model before the data was applied by an independent statistician um, from a Russell Group uh, University, um, uh, somebody with expertise in uh, education statistics, and would the model disadvantage on gender or school background type? And she identified that it would not. Um, but that was before we received the data, so we, we tested the data at that point. Okay. Okay, Catherine? Um, just uh, two final points, um, if that's all right, Chair. Just mentioned there that you had... Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hello. Um, Jocelyn, you mentioned that there, there was something similar to an equality impact assessment carried out ahead of um, the, the modelling being put into place. But if how confident would CIA be now on this side of it um, if, if an equality impact assessment was carried out? It was, as I pointed out before, we had no data of this type, so we couldn't make an assessment on the data prior to insertion into the model. All we could do is carry out an assessment of the model before the data arrived, and we used the model on prior data um, across Northern Ireland, unique data to Northern Ireland at that basis. And uh, as I said before, that, that impact assessment didn't show. There, there is at this moment, in terms of outcomes, I am still confident we've seen on gender, it is reflecting what was reported to us, that the, the gap on gender has remained the same. And I've, as I reported, actually, there's an increase in non-selective um, outcomes um, and at, at certain key grades. And lastly, lastly, Chair, um, due to circumstances, would research fees be scrapped for students who decide to go down that route? Uh, uh, you broke up there slightly, Catherine, if you could repeat that, thanks. Due to the current fee being scrapped for students needed to go down that route. The, the same part broke up again, sorry. So we've got fees scrapped. 
What what's before phase? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, due to due to the due to the current circumstances. Like reset fees be scrapped for students who decide to go down this route. Thank you, Catherine. Reset fees. Yep. Um, we, we've we've always taken the the position that we would charge when somebody entered for a, a qualification. Um, we have scrapped fees for appeals. We haven't set up our fees model uh, for 2020 2021. But I would point out. I think the point has been made um, before about. Um, some of the awarding bodies are uh, dropping their, their, their costs. SIA is predominantly the cheapest provider by any qualification type or any subject matter um, in, in the UK. Um, we, we always try and keep our fees to the, the, the minimum um, in consideration of that. But as I said at the moment, we haven't made a decision on, on free resets. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Catherine. Justin McNulty, MLA. Yep. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Justin, and thanks, Margaret. Um, guys, I'm a little bit aghast by the seemingly uh, lack of awareness in terms of what's going on here in terms of the crisis. So many children, uh, pupils, um, parents, and teachers and principals are um, coming to us screaming about over this last day, and uh, it seems to me that you're determined to hold tight hold firm and say this is this is okay and there's there's no nothing happening here move on and that to me is extraordinary um you've mentioned the appeals process so i'd just like to question you uh, justin what contingency planning has been put in place here to ensure that there is sufficient capacity within cta to address the deluge of appeals that are going to most certainly come into the system as an outcome of this process which to me is a very very flawed process um, have you got capacity? And also, in in further on from that, do schools have capacity to accommodate resets? The, like the, the, the message coming to me very clearly from principals and from parents and from pupils is that the trend is very much downwards in terms of the results expected, the results predicted, and the results awarded. So is there capacity there, number one, in relation to um, appeals, and number two, in relation to resets in the system? In regards to the appeals process, as I uh, outlined to a member before, we, we have developed the process so that we can streamline and speed through the process as quickly as possible um, to help young people, but also to help schools. We provide an awful lot of data to schools in advance of an appeal through an electronic system, uh, an online system, which we've been walking them through, and that saves them time and effort, and it saves us time and effort, so it reduces resource impact. But we've also um, configured teams so that we can support. We increased our help desk capacity. Uh, to support the telephone lines and, and to date, uh, whilst I recognise that the telephone lines are, are busier, they're holding up uh, to the capacity and we will increase resource further if we require to do that. In regards to the reset component and capacity into next year, we were also of the view that we would run the normal examination timetable. Normal examination timetable would remain if people wished to take resets, they would do that within that presence. I believe at this point in time there is sufficient uh, capacity, but we will have to wait for the reset data post, uh, post results across it. And I, I talk about total capacity um, with inside the system depending on the reset uh, requirement. This is, of course, all subject to COVID pandemic restrictions. If they, they change, I'm basing that on an assessment of the new school day restart program as it currently stands. In terms of the, this uh, magic um, algorithm, which is all-encompassing, is there any distinguishment, distinguishment made between boys and girls? No, we, we, we do not include any bias or, or any indicator or any um, uh, value. So for, it's exactly the same. Gender, and, yes, and boys and girls. So it doesn't accommodate any uh, recognition that boys are last lap sprinters? It doesn't, um, accommodate, it doesn't include any accommodation for exam season momentum. Well, as, as we've shown from the indicators and the results uh, arising, the gap between boys and girls remains consistent with previous years. Um, there, there was no need in the model. And as I said before, we had an independent assessment of the model. Uh, and in testing, it didn't show any gender bias. So um, it wasn't a, a need to put a factor or an indicator. In fact, um, you know, what, we, what we did with this is try to work on the basis that what would the grade be had examinations occurred in normal circumstances. 
um, and, and that wouldn't have a gender um, bias within it. I mean, that's uh, surprising to say the least, given the, the, the behavioural differences in terms of uh, boys and girls as approaches to exams and uh, consistency throughout the, the, the study period. Um, girls are obviously much more diligent early on, but boys leave it to the last minute often, but they cram and they do get there in the end. And I just think it's, it's strange how that, the algorithm doesn't in any way point to that. Um, another really important aspect, you know, as we mentioned already, in terms of the quality impact, uh, was the quality impact carried out with respect to the study patterns and the uplift of performance in boys' schools from AS to A2, and hence the awarded grades. As I said before, we carried out an independent assessment on the basis of gender, and that was to uh, quality screen the model. We couldn't have quality screen prior to the data arriving because we didn't have data on which to operate that, but we had previous data in order to assess that, so that was done. Okay, how do you explain in uh, St. Pat's School, Armagh, for example, where they had um, 82 students and one student had improved grades? That's 1.2 percent. 11 students had grades that remained the same, 13 percent, and 70 students had grades that decreased 85 percent. How can that be explained? Is that a, is that one of the anom anomalies in the system? I think on on an individual school basis, and again, if if that school um, wishes to make contact with us, we'll have a look. There are many factors um, that relate to the outcomes in any school in any normal year. Um, if this is a factor, then, then we need to take that into consideration. But again, it has to go through the um, appeals process, and we'll consider that at a time. I don't think you can go... That's, that's something that's been over in this conversation this morning, is this uh, concept of anom anomalies in the results. What, what, give me more information on what the anomalies are in terms of the results. In, in terms of the results, uh, as I said before, we were looking for... Um, uh, outcomes that were not what we would have anticipated. We were able to flag those to schools. They were often in individual cases, and sometimes we suspected it might have been to do with the data that was actually supplied to us, but we need to, we need to um, work through each individual case to work out if that's the case, what that data is, and, and where it would apply. Um, and at the individual level, um, that could have been a, a grade um, that wasn't what we anticipated when we validated and mapped it against um, the, the centre assess grade. Uh, so we went back to yeah, the school proactively. Are you still standing firm that this process is fit for purpose? I still stand firm that this process, given, given what we were asked to do, this process was the best process available. I was severely questioned that. Thank you very much, Justin. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, members. Thank you very much indeed for your questions, uh, Justin Martyr, Thank you for your, your time today. Um, the the time that the committee has allocated to these matters this morning, and the time that uh, the minister and yourselves have allocated to these matters, um, shows um, how important we all regard them, um, and and we emphasise that um, we we recognise. Um, just how important these grades and qualifications are um, for children and young people um, in terms of rewarding their endeavour and in terms of pathways and, and progressions. We know that um, their, their lives will not be defined by them and that they can achieve um, their, their potential um, with the hard work and the support that they need. What I do think it exposes, Justin, is the extent to which standardisation is used to moderate examinations, um, and maybe that's a, a learning curve for all of us. Um, assessing the outcome generated by this particular standardisation um, that, that I actually am um, willing to acknowledge and accept was produced with a significant amount of hard work, most likely good faith and clearly expertise, um, has, has, however, according to the Minister himself today, generated incorrect results, which has caused distress and challenges, distress to children and young people and challenges to them in terms of their qualifications and their progression. Um, the extent to which remains to be seen, and as you've said today, um, UCAS appear to be saying that there are positive um, factors here in terms of access to university, uh, further education and, and other pathways as well. but. The question remains for all of us how we best remedy the distress and the challenge that have been experienced by many children and young people 
in the time scale available and I don't see how the appeals process is capable of of meeting that aim in the time scale available but we sincerely appreciate the the time that you've given us today to go into the detail on these issues um, and obviously in the short term prior to any political decision to uh, respond to these challenges in a different way that appeals process is what is available to children and young people across Northern Ireland um, and we would ask that the the communications, the information that is available to those children and young people to ensure that they access that appeal process in as timely a way and efficient a way as possible is made as clear as possible. Um, and we, as a committee, will remain in contact with you, no doubt, prior to next week's um, great awards as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, can I ask the clerk um, of any further action or uh, summary for us to consider? Mr. Chairperson? Yep. I just ask uh, Assembly Broadcasting to bring um, Mr. McNulty, Ms. Mullen, and Ms. Kelly back into the spotlight again so they can Thanks, participate in the um, discussion. Whoops. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Ty. Still so getting echo? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we are. You're getting a Christmas card from Justin. Yeah, this chance. Sorry, members. Oh, it's been nice to him. Oh. Right, right, members, can you still hear me? Um, uh, Karen, Catherine, and Justin, can you hear okay? Yeah. yeah. Roger. Yep. Jolly yep. good. Okay. Right, sorry, so a quick one then. So, Chairperson, I think the committee has agreed to write to SIA expressing its concerns around the anomalies around the communications relating to the model, etc. We've already asked to see the model. Uh, we're also expressing concerns, I think, around the capacity of CA to deal with um, appeals. Uh, additionally, uh, we're asking CA to provide us with an explanation and examples uh, around how Cs can, uh, AS can turn into Us at, uh, at A, A2. Additionally, I think our committee asking to see have sight of the disadvantage impact report, yes. albeit based on previous data. Uh, so that's what we're, I think we're asking for SIA. Just, Chair, if the committee can also clarify just its position on resits, in addition to the thing you've already agreed and voted on, um, is it the case that the committee is calling on the department to um, provide a reset option um, for? As the Chair has pointed out, uh, in lieu of not actually doing what we're suggesting. Yeah, in, in, three in, tiers. In, so obviously it's that priority order. We want to see significant change. Like the Welsh model or whatever it is, um, and if not, then the appeals and free resets. And is that the unanimous position of the? But I think we need to be careful here because we're we're saying that we will accept the Plan B option then. Well, I, I think you the sorry, Chair. I think the committee has agreed I what it wants. What we um, want. I, yeah. I, perhaps perhaps we could rephrase the approach to um, reset as to what consideration is being given to yeah. facilitate an autumn. Reset option. Yeah, rather than jolly good. Yeah, yep, jolly good. Thanks, chairperson. Also, um, and we didn't. We just went over it really quickly uh, before. Just in terms of GCSEs, and the results are coming out um, on Thursday. Is it the case the committee is expressing its concern? Well, I asked the question to and, and asked him did he have a concern. So, and uh, yeah, I think that I'd be, I think we the committee probably should be concerned because how could you not be? Yeah, given what is. Well, Thank given what's happened so far, it's hard to know who's concerned. But the confidence, it, it keeps getting asked about the confidence, and we're in, it, we're in the scenario, regardless of how things have went, we're, we don't have the confidence now. Okay, agreed. Is that agreed? Agreed, members? Yep. We're not getting, I'm not getting, sorry, I'm not sorry. getting any. A fur, sorry, Karen, a further. I didn't agree with that, um, I did not get the ballot at all, I didn't get what previously was agreed. I'm just hearing uh, music in the background somewhere, so I'm not hearing the conversation. Try to recap more clearly. Can you hear me, Karen? I can hear you, Chris. Okay. Um, so, the, the Peter, do you want to try the summary there again? Okay, then, yeah. Karen, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. Justin, can you hear as well? Yeah. Um, okay. Catherine, can you hear what I'm saying? Okay, so it's just in summary, writing to see you expressing concerns around anomalies and uh, the communications. We've already asked for, uh, to see the, uh, the, the model. Uh, we're also expressing concern about CA's capacity to deal with appeals. Um, so we're writing to CA, additionally asking them to provide examples and an explanation 
of how C's at A S can turn into U's at A two. Um, and we're also asking to see the disadvantage impact report, albeit that it's based on previous data, uh, so we can see where they came from. So that's what we're asking for CA. Remember, we've already agreed to write to the minister and ask for lots of other stuff too. So in terms of resit, uh, I think um, we're writing to the minister, asking him to clarify what consideration is being given to the option of an autumn resit um, for um, you know, pupils who are dissatisfied um, with their uh, results. And then uh, the committee, I think, has also agreed to indicate that it is concerned about the forthcoming GCSE results, given that they're going to be, in part, based on pre prior school performance, so that there might be, if you will, inbuilt the possibility of inbuilt disadvantage. Okay. So hopefully, members, that's okay. Or if members yep. want to amend? Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Thanks. Uh, so then, Chair, sorry to ask, right, what would you like to do next week? Yeah. Um, that we had scheduled to meet on Thursday and that was going to be well that was going to be a lot of things uh, that was going to be restart and um, uh, to talk about results yep would you like two meetings next week yeah um, can, Clark can I can I propose if everyone can hear me that we aim schedules permitting to meet on Tuesday um, morning or afternoon to hear from the minister with regards to school restart and also to invite the Northern Ireland Teaching Council and ASCAL um, to brief the committee on school restart. Okay. Um, again, Chairperson. Karen, can you hear us? No. 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 Let me try. Let me try again. Um, so I'm I'm proposing that we meet on Tuesday uh, morning or afternoon on the urgent issue of school restart guidance, and that we endeavour to hear from the minister and the Northern Ireland Teaching Council and ASCAL, Association of School and College Leaders. Can you catch that? I'm off, but I can have to say. Okay. Well, uh, early next week, or we, can, we can aim for Tuesday, unless members think another day is, is better. Okay, it's a bit of the afternoon for me, that's what you think. Yeah. We'll try and make sure that diaries align as best as possible, but we'll introduce that additional meeting. Okay, so are we saying Tuesday afternoon, members? Yep. Um, and then assuming presume, the minister's available. I presume the Thursday meeting, Clark, was in relation to GCSE results. It could be. So do you want to shift that to Friday? Yes, that makes sense. If assuming Justin's available, so that's all we'll do. Yep. Um, no. So uh, I'm fine with the Friday. Uh, Tuesday may be a difficult day for me. We can we can lay, we can lay as, we can lay as outside of public yeah. format here to to agree that specific time and date. But in principle, <laughs> members are <laughs> members are agreed to uh, a meeting with regards to school restart at earlier in the week um, with the minister and with the uh, teaching unions. Agreed. Chair. Okay. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, Daniel. Yep. Uh, just uh, obviously not for uh, the uh, next week with GCSEs and else, but. I'm just wondering, how soon do you think the department or CA will reveal to us the algorithm or the formula? Because I think when that happens, Chair, it would be quite appropriate to maybe invite various academics that would understand it to come before the committee to explain it to us, because I'm in no way uh, understanding of how this would work. I don't even think those who are running it understand how it works, being honest, but that's... Yep, happy to respond. I. I I um, would imagine that that response would be prompt. However, as I said in my other remarks there, Daniel, I, I think this um, matter has exposed um, a need to um, further interrogate the matter of standardisation of yes. exams in general. So I think we can return to that theme um, and well, on that I, occasion, by all means, take I, I, evidence from other um, experts. I, I would just make this point strongly, Chair, because everything that the Minister and CIA has said today seems to lean heavily on the algorithm uh, and the, the, the formula that was used. And the, until we can understand that or check these calculations or have someone who's able to do so and, and question them, uh, I, th I, th I think it's very important that when we receive it that we do ask people like Dr Hugh Morrison, if he's willing, and others, uh, and others to... Uh, consider coming yeah. as well. Uh, uh, members, me just members, members are obviously at, at liberty to engage with people um, outside of the formal setting of the committee, which I'm very grateful for your patience and forbearance with today has um, lasted four plus hours. Um, so 
If clerk, any other business? So, Charlie, just to be yeah, clear, can I, can I Robin, by all means, yeah. Uh, two videos were referred to, which were, um, would it be possible, Chair, for us to view those videos? I've circulated the link um, yesterday. It's just the one video, and it's it's on the CIA website, and it it sort of says a lot of the same stuff that's in the presentation. But it is it's quite instructive. Yeah. So it is. I'll I'll send you that link again. Please. Okay. Um, so it's possibly Tuesday. Minister, if available, plus NITC and Askell. Yeah. And then possibly Friday. I would imagine CEO will be okay. Are you trying to get the minister as well on Friday? He'd be well, most welcome. Um, and indeed, that Tuesday meeting, um, we can, given that we have made it an additional meeting further to what we requested of him today, we would obviously make ourselves available to him um, if, if necessary in terms of an adjusted time there. I think it's really, really urgent that, as a committee, we give um, detailed consideration to school restart guidance. Okay. Yeah. So that, being, so that being the case, members, and not a lot of notice, there won't be a very big meeting pack, very yep. thin meeting pack. No, that's Probably like that. Um, so, Chair, that being the case. Okay. No other business? No. That's it. Any other business, members? No. No. Okay. Well, we'll send details of, of the next meeting as soon as possible. Thank, thank you for your contribution today, members. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland...